All righty, we'll get started with our workshops. Um, call this to order and want to point out that our uh, fee based right away access for fiber um, is being postponed um, probably till August for adoption, um, getting further comments and things that we want to address with that. So we'll be postponing that. <coughs> Am I not close enough? There we go. <laughs> And Jessica will be joining us when she can by video and then in person. So right away, condemnation, Keith. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Keith Stefanik, CDOT Chief Engineer. Uh, the right away workshop is uh, in accordance with, or the, <clears throat> excuse me, the condemnation uh, right away workshop is, is in, in accordance with CRS 43-1-208 where CDOT seeks condemnation authority. Under consideration today is a single ownership that includes a permanent and temporary easements. The parcels are on or adjacent to State Highway 92 in Delta County. Uh, the packet of information provided uh, to the commission includes a description of the portion of the highway to be established, description of the property to be acquired, the property address, the size of the permanent easements and the size of the temporary easements. Um, uh, the purpose of the, uh, of the, of the acquisition and then uh, a map showing that information. So diving into the project, the project is a region three project. It's located in, in Delta County uh, near Hotchkiss. It's on state highway or Colorado route 92. Um, the owners are Dion Luke and Dixie Luke. And the purpose of the project is to improve safety on the high traffic corridor. Next slide, please. So here's a, an overview of the of the property and the um, permanent and temporary easements. So you can see there in yellow, um, located on the south side of uh, of State Highway 92. Next slide, please. Uh, a little uh, blow up of of the projects. So you can see the 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 triangle there is the PE the permanent easement. Adjacent to that is a temporary easement. And then uh, just to the south is a temporary easement for a new access, a new or, or relocated access point. Next slide. Uh, just on a little bit further east uh, on the property, there's a two, two more temporary easements. Uh, you can see in the triangle is uh, TE 22B and then uh, 22C on the, on the right hand side of the screen. So throughout the, the process, uh, CDOT has engaged the landowner. So initially um, the, the waiver value was issued by CDOT on December 16th, an amount of $800. Uh, notice of intent to acquire was sent out on December 28th. And we made our initial offer on the 28th as well as $800. $800. Uh, one of the one of the uh, issues with this with this project is uh, the owner had a field access um, along State Highway 92 that will need to be closed as part of this project and relocated on uh, on an adjacent uh, county road. So the new new planned access uh, is within a temporary easement that we're proposing. It's uh, far off the highway center line, and um, we, it, it it is close enough that we can build that as part of our project. Um, the owner is concerned about uh, the slope of the new pr proposed access onto the onto the county road um, due to the maneuverability of, of their hay trailer. Um, owner has a bid from the contractor to build the access point at a different location, but it's uh, it's too far out for us to build it ourselves. So that that is the main sticking point on here, and the negotiations have really um, failed at this point. Next slide. Oh, so that's the that's the the end of the information. Um, you know, we we want to continue to work with the with the landowner throughout this process, but we feel that in order to move the project forward, we need to have the condemnation authority uh, to move that project forward. But hopes to have an amicable solution with the property owner. With that, um, I'll turn it over. With any questions, either to myself or RTD um, Jason Smith of Region Three. Questions? Seeing none. 
Is that the only right away? Yep. All righty. Um, budget workshop, Jeff. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, so we have uh, 45 minutes, uh, and I think we're right on time, 45 minutes um, allotted for today's budget workshop, uh, which includes about 30 minutes uh, to review this month's budget amendment and supplement requests. And I think we'd also set aside about 15 minutes um, at uh, commissioner's request uh, to have a round table uh, on general budget topics, give, give the commission an opportunity to, uh, to have some open discussion, offer some thoughts. Uh, timing wise, I think that's actually very helpful for us as we start to prepare for the next budget cycle. So before I get started, I guess I'd ask uh, 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 the chair if you have a preference, if you wanna cover the uh, amendments and supplements first and then go into discussion or do the discussion first and then go into the amendments and supplements. Uh, I think we'll do the amendments supplement first. And then this sounds good. Okay. So, um, so this month's uh, budget amendment, um, we'll, we'll start there. This month's budget amendment includes two items. Um, let's go on to the next uh, slide. Um, thank you. Um, the first is an amendment to incorporate some additional federal bridge funding. Um, the second is an amendment to allocate funds for a loan, loan to CTIO for operating and maintenance costs on the C-470 corridor. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the first amendment, which we'll review in more detail on the subsequent slides, uh, will increase line five um, structures, that's the structures line, um, by 10.25 million, and it will increase line 56, the off-system bridge program, by 5.25 million. Uh, the second amendment, will reallocate 4 million from the commission reserve funds line, that's line 73, to the agency operations line, line 66. Let's go to the next slide. So um, the 15.5 million uh, in bridge replacement and rehabilitation program funds um, are additional federal funds uh, received in the current fiscal year. Um, these are funds above the levels that were planned in the Authorization Act, the IIJA, which is what we build our budget around. Um, when Congress actually um, does a final appropriations act uh, in some years, um, they uh, include supplemental funding. So they, they identify uh, some additional funding beyond what was an anticipated in authorized levels uh, and make that available to the state. Um, some years it happens, some years it doesn't. It, it comes in different years, sometimes in different programs. Um, this year in their final appropriations act for fiscal year 23, they provided additional supplemental funding for um, the federal bridge replacement and rehabilitation program. And, and that um, additional supplemental funding to Colorado totals uh, 15.5 million. So uh, we worked with, uh, with uh, the CDOT bridge staff to identify what we think are the highest priority uses for those funds. And with your approval of the budget amendment, we'll allocate uh, those dollars to the structures program and the off-system bridge program. So I'm gonna ask Keith um, if he would take the next couple slides and then Keith is going to walk you through um, how we anticipate using these uh, additional supplemental bridge funds. Thanks, Jeff. Now, I just wanna start off with, uh, you know, this is a, a good issue to figure out where we wanna put $15.5 million into our, into our bridge program. Our state bridge engineer was very excited to put together some slides of where um, he and his staff uh, felt that it was appropriate to put it into the to the bridge uh, the bridge program. So we went through a, a variety of of different options and landed at um, basically these three. So allocated the fifteen and a half million across three areas of of need when it comes to um, the overall bridge program uh, in Colorado. So the first slide here is really uh, to to finalize a a program, if you want to call it, um, that was uh, mandated by FHWA for for all of the states. So uh, the first one is off-system load rating. So even even as uh, state bridge engineer and, and CDOT, we're responsible to uh, monitor and report on off-system uh, bridges across the state as well as on-system. So we're, we did a very good job with our on-system lo load ratings and got those complete. Our off-system load ratings um, it fell a little bit far behind. Uh, we need a lot of support from consultants to 
to complete these off system load ratings. Our staff is inundated with, with other, um, other tasks that they are doing. So this money here, the $5.25 million would help us um, uh, get con uh, consultants on board to uh, spend about $1.75 million annually over three years in order to complete these off system ratings uh, by the end of 2026, which would meet uh, FHWA's uh, mandate. We've talked to them, they'd, they're, they'd be very happy if we can get it done by the end of, end of 26. So this is an area where we think the additional funding would really help um, our overall program out and reduce uh, reduce any risks out there uh, that may, may occur on these bridges um, to make sure that they can carry the correct loads. Next slide. Uh, this is the, the majority of the, the larger portion of the request is in, in item number two here, which is labeled as fatigue cracks. Uh, we have several uh, steel bridges across, uh, across Colorado, mainly focused on a few corridors. And you can, I don't know if you can really see it in that graph, um, but it's, in, it's the middle graphic. It says count on structures with fatigue cracks by route. Uh, so you can see there's a heavy concentration of these structure types around the um, uh, I-76 and 70 interchanges. So we, over the over the past several um, years, we've started seeing some of these uh, what we call fatigue cracks in the shear zone of the structures, and we would like to to uh, uh, allot some money and dedicate some money to address those structures, mainly on I-76 um, that have these known fatigue cracks. What we would like to do is get that get that accomplished. Take those lessons learned from that from that particular location, then spread it throughout the state and uh, increase the longevity of our our structures. So all of these structures that have these fatigue cracks um, in them are large structures. It would be very costly to replace. So uh, the money, the ten point, uh, a little over ten million dollars devoted to to this program would um, increase the uh, the longevity and structure life of those bridges. And get and keep them from getting into our uh, poor or replacement condition uh, um, areas. And then the next slide is the last area. This is a a, a minor ask, but an important ask. Um, there's a, a picture in the in the middle of the screen here. It's a um, a bridge in Tennessee where there was a a uh, you can see a crack in the in the in the butt weld here. And this bridge ended up collapsing due to this due to this uh, this circumstance. So we want to make sure we avoid that um, throughout our state, and we want to focus about hundred thousand dollars into investigation costs. So these are above and beyond the normal inspections that we would do on these type of bridges, um, just to make sure that we are not experiencing the same issue uh, that that other states are experiencing with these butt welds. And I think that's it, Jeff. Okay. Sure. So, Jeff, just help me out. I've been trying to follow this. Which line? Uh, Keith was just talking through. Which line item is that in the budget? So, in the budget, it's the dollars are split across two different lines. And so, let me look at my notes here. Um, so, ten point two five million. That would be the dollars associated with this um, steel butt weld investigation and the dollars associated with the fatigue cracks 10.25 million would go to line 50 or i'm sorry line five structures so structures okay. on line five actually rolls up a couple of different programs but one of them is the bridge program and that's the 10.3 that's the 10.3 yes right and, and then the um the 5.25 million uh, associated with the off system bridge investigation that goes to a separate program line called the off 56 system, uh line 56 you got it all right all right got it got it thank you Here. yeah this is a question i probably should have asked years ago and that is uh i presume the state carries insurance you mentioned insurance where does that show up in the budget um i guess i I think it, can you be a little bit more specific? Let me ask you that when you're saying insurance. Um, I, so I think it probably it shows about up in insurance on on system bridges, for example. I'm not sure that I have an answer for that. I don't think we've, we don't have sort of a universal policy on um, on our infrastructure, if that's kind of what you're referring to in terms of like a, a, a 
uh, a policy that I think we're paying for across all of our assets in our um, that would be reflected in the budget. So if there's a structural failure, um, how how are you covered? <laughs> Why not? My experience is, generally speaking, it's been self-insured. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm actually. I think that's what I think. It yeah. is. George is George is helping me out a little bit here. The, the state's risk pool. So the state has a general risk pool that's self-insured. So if there were there were a failure, the state's risk pool would would be the thing to cover it. Thank you. So so and actually, thank you for that um, phone a friend there because that that helps me better. <laughs> that that actually helps me better answer your question, which is I think we do pay. Um, essentially premiums on the state risk pool um, through our common policy, which is essentially the, the, the transfers we make to other state agencies, including paying his salary to the AG's office. Um, so I think that actually would show up probably in, in either the administration line of our budget or the agency operations line of our budget. Okay, and Commissioner Adams explained to me self-insurance, <laughs> which sounds risky. It's generally how most governments are kind of insured except for liability to other people so, <laughs> that's generally how we have to cover it in our own budgets <laughs> good question yeah. Um, yeah good question so any additional questions on this item if not i will move us on to the second item in the budget amendment okay okay um so the the second item in this month's budget amendment um, is uh, is the al al reallocation of four million from the TC program reserve uh, to uh, to fund an operations and maintenance loan to CTIO uh, for the C four seventy corridor. So as I mentioned earlier, that would move four million from line seventy three commissioner reserve funds to line sixty six agency operations fund. Um, Subsequently, when HPTE actually draws on that loan, it would then move um, off of the seat outside of the budget to the HPTE side um, or CTIO side, I should say. So um, with that, uh, by way of introduction, I'm gonna ask Nick Farber uh, to walk you through uh, this request. Thank you, Jeff. Go on to the next slide. Back in June of 2017, CTIO closed on a $107 million TIFIA loan and um, $176 million in toll back revenue bonds for the C-470 project, which is from I-25 to Wadsworth on uh, the C-470 corridor. Um, we anticipated opening the lanes in the loans, in the, in the loan and in the bond agreement. We anticipated opening the, the lanes in 2018. Um, the construction project was two years late. Uh, and we opened the project for tolling in August of 2020. Um, you know, obviously during that time, we were in the middle of a pandemic. And you know, when we opened it, we knew, we had a feeling that it, you know, traffic was gonna be depressed because we, traffic was depressed on all of our express lanes. Uh, and I think as we saw traffic come back on I-25, Mountain Express Lane, Central 70, uh, you know, all across our, our whole, all of our express lane projects, we were always hopeful that the new thing in terms of like uh, uh, coming back to work, um, vaccinations, things like that, that would push people to, to leave, the, leave their home and, and go back into the office. And, um, you know, we have seen that across the corridor, but not to the growth, not to the extent that we, we forecasted in our traffic and revenue forecast uh, that was finished in 2016. Because the project was delivered two years late um, in the interagency agreement between CTIO and CDOT, <coughs> CDOT agreed to pay CTIO for late delivery of the project. Um, so that was, you, CDOT paid us seven and a half million dollars for that. We also drew, did another draw on our TIFIA loan for capitalized interests that we funded for the project as well. Um, those, what's left over from those funds is currently sitting in our surplus account. Um, early last year, early in 2022, we, 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 were, we constantly monitor the corridor on a weekly, monthly basis. We're always looking at trends, seeing where the usage of the express lanes is. And we engaged a traffic and revenue advisor to to monitor traffic volumes, 
um, and to implement a new toll rate schedule based on the traffic patterns that we have observed out on C-470 because of how things have changed in terms of travel because of the pandemic. Um, while we have pre hit pre-construction pre levels, 2016 levels, as I said, we just haven't hit the growth um, that we saw. Uh, but we continue to abide by the reporting requirements with the TIFI alone and the toll back revenue bonds. You can go on to the next slide. Uh, this slide shows the variance between the forecast and where we actually are now on the corridor. Um, the forecast is the, the gray dotted line above the red line, and the red line is actually where we are now. Uh, and the bars the, going in the southward direction show the variance between the forecast and where we actually are. Uh, so in February of this year, we were about 40, 44, 45% down in terms of actual versus forecast. Next slide. This slide shows the shortfall between our, um, our, the, the revenue available for debt service, our total debt service, our operations and maintenance inspections and the, and the shortfall. So over the next year, we anticipate, we are conservatively estimate a shortfall of about $3.7 million, million in operations and maintenance expenses on C-470. This is a gross pledge project. So when we, that means that all the toll revenue that comes in from the project first has to pay debt service. Anything left over after debt service then goes to pay operations and maintenance costs. And then after that, it goes into a surplus account. Right now, we have sufficient cash flow to pay our debt service on the corridor, but we do not have enough cash flow through toll revenue to pay our uh, operations and maintenance expenses, which consists of not only paying CDOT to do plowing, crack filling, pothole repair, uh, snow and ice removal, but also our tolling back office expenses to the 470 back highway, public highway authority. Um, and then maintaining the tolling equipment out there and maintaining all aspects of the express lane. Um, so I just want to emphasize that this is a conservative uh, estimate. Uh, we're requesting $4 million. Um, we will be hope to, we will be drawing on it, but we will not, we hope to not draw on the entire amount. Um, over the next year, we are engaging a traffic and revenue advisor. I think I, this is in the next slide. Um, I'm going to go into the form of the agreement first, then I'll go into what, what we're doing. So you can go on to the next slide, slide 45. Um, so the backup loan that's in the commission packet was agreed upon by the commission and the CTIO board when we closed on the TIFIA loan and the bonds back in 2017. Um, lenders wanted to see the form of the loan agreement in case we ever got here. I wanted to be able to sign off on it and approve it. Um, it allows us to defer interest if there's not sufficient surplus cash flow. Um, it's a 40 year term um, at the SIB rate. And that is a 40 year term because in the TIFI loan and in the bond documents, CDOT agreed that once they make us a backup loan, that is, the backup being paid back is subordinate to being TIFIA payback and the bonds being paid back. So CDOT will be paid back once TIFIA essentially be paid back last. Um, and that is the deal that we, we struck with TIFIA and the bondholders when we borrowed the funds on C-470. Director Adams? Uh, when you're done, Nick. Okay. I have a question of you and Jeff and George that I think all three of you agree one of you may be more accurate, but, but it would be aimed at one of you. But I'll wait. Yeah, and that's why the 40 year term, because we have to, you know, we have to see through the bonds and see through the TIFI alone. And then the SIB rate is 3.5% because that's currently what the commission has set the SIB rate at. Um, a question that we received, uh, Commissioner Stewart asked in the CTI board meeting today is like, why do we have to go through this? You know, commission loans. Seed out money all the time, and we have to do this because we are an enterprise. And if we did not do it, 
um, we put our enterprise status in jeopardy. And it has to be an arm's length transaction between CDOT and CTIO. You, you just can't transfer budget to us. Like you would just like, can't like headquarters transferring budget to region one. It just can't happen that way. It has to be an arm's length agreement between the two of us. Uh, and even though we're a division of CDOT governed by our board, it has to be that arm's length transaction. Um, yeah, and I, I think I made the last point already. Um, if you can go on to the next slide. Nick, Nick do you want to address too, because we had a commission, uh, comment from a question from a commissioner about um, the 40 year term and you want to clarify the ability to prepay? Yeah, so we have the ability to prepay, but we have to pay back Tiffy and the bonds first. Yeah, because I, um, that was something I, I, I negotiated the Tiffy loan and the bonds. Yeah, that was something that Tiffia and the bondholders wanted. They wanted to know that they were going to be paid back first. Um, yeah, so even if we do have the ability to prepay, so you know, hopefully is my hope. And and I said this uh, we, to the Denver Post the other day that it's my hope, you know, that we will see traffic growth on this corridor again, and we are seeing it now. We are seeing growth on the corridor. Um, you know, will we? But not on the current forecast. No, we are not seeing it on the current forecast. I do think we will get back into a place where, with the new traffic revenue forecast, with our lenders, where we are sustainable on this corridor again. Um, and once we are sustainable again, and we're taking in sufficient cash flows to pay debt service, and hopefully that pledge revenues, the toll revenue, can hit the bottom of the waterfall, the surplus account, which is what we call it that we can prepay debt. Um, and we get there by one, as in this slide, is pursuing additional revenues on the corridor. One, and that's through reducing leakage through new tolling equipment. Um, our current toll equipment is we um, was contracted through a firm that no longer makes it and no longer makes uh, replacement parts. So, it's basically, we are working with E470. If they have a camera go down, we'll borrow swap cameras and we'll just kind of move cameras around. We have a tolling equipment provider. We have to open up Central 70. We have to open up the gap first before we, we can go out there and replace equipment. We just don't have the manpower or the bandwidth to go out there right now and replace the equipment. Neither does E470. Um, so we, that will happen. So gap, we assume will go live this fall. Yeah, we have a good feeling that it'll go live this fall because Central 70 is about to go live next month. W once South, South Gap goes live, we can then work with E470 and our tolling equipment provider, ETC, to replace the tolling equipment. Uh, E470 just recently replaced their tolling equipment out on their toll road um, and had seen a, a significant uptick in revenue just because of leakage. They had just significant leakage with their toll equipment. And we are also install. We have also started installing uh, Blissways safety enforcement program equipment on C470, uh, which will discourage weaving on the express lanes. Um, so that is coming as well, um, probably later operating later this summer. We are also working with our vendors, with Cdot, uh, to reduce operating costs as much as we possibly can and still operate. C470 in a responsible manner. Um, we have already talked, I went out to New York in, in April. I've talked to bondholders um, about the situation that we are in. Uh, and we have communicated them that we will, uh, this plan and that we will be in touch with them probably late winter, early spring next year to start restructuring the existing debt. Um, we the bonds that we took out on the project are callable at the December 31st of 2024. So we'll be working towards finishing something before the call date on those bonds. As I said earlier, we're also be updating the traffic and revenue forecast. Um, and we will obviously keep you, the T Transportation Commission and the board uh, in the loop on all of our actions that we'll be taking over the coming year. Um, and I th I think that's yeah, all we had in terms of a presentation. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have.
All right, Mila. I think it's taken me a time, Jeff, and to understand this marvelous schedule here, but I think I got it. So this is operating like a line of credit. And as a line of credit, the basic thing here is you put it in agency operations, but it is not part of the this, of this CTIO budget until it actually moves over to what is called somewhere between line 91 and 98. And that's when it actually, if ever, and George, to your point this morning, we don't want to draw down on this until it's absolutely necessary as CTIO because it goes straight through to that bottom bucket and it does not help with our basic issue with the lenders, as I understand it. And so, so the way this works is if we, we may not, given the performance of C470, it's maybe likely that we need to use some of it, but, but right now it's possible this may not actually get used. So that's, that's really just clear for me, because if I look at the CTIO budget, it's currently not planned for the $4 million, but but if they have to use the four million to draw down on it, it would be, it's not necessary for them to come back to the Transportation Commission in order to get that approval, you'll just be able to use it. Correct. So, so when that happens, and this is what we're giving you the right, the ability to negotiate with the lender in order to restructure our basic loan, so that we get a more favorable term on the performance of C470. Correct. Right. <clears throat> Correct. I, I think I've got that and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it, but it took me a while to get there, but I think I've got it. And George is, <laughs> George is, is nodding. So I, I think I'm clear on why this is done this way and the recording of it in our system from a budget approval standpoint, we have to approve it as a commission it essentially creating this basically line of credit for CTIO, which if they can fix our operations and renegotiate the loan, this becomes less of something they have to draw up us. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and just to clarify on this, there are there are two separate actions that the commission will be asked to take on this tomorrow. So uh, as part of the budget amendment, you essentially will approve allocating $4 million to the purposes, to the purpose of the loan. Separately, there will, there's a uh, resolution where you will actually approve the loan itself. Yeah, and we had a question from Commissioner Holguin. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a great question. Uh, so we, th this is something we do across all of our express lanes that we emphasize to users, you might see it on, RTD bus sides, you know, cross the line, pay a fine. We put that up on VMS boards, mobile VMS boards. Um, it's also, we also try to emphasize it's not the Autobahn. You can't go as fast as you want. You have to obey the law and go the speed limit. Uh, we, and as you see the safety enforcement program rolling out too, that's gonna be um, a large push in terms of cross the line and pay a fine. And you will pay a fine if you cross the lines. It'll be uh, a $75 fine if you don't, if you pay within uh, 30 days and it goes up to $150 if you don't pay with it in that time. So um, it will be a, you know, a, a big incentive to, to, to pay. And, the, the, and I just wanna make it clear too, um, some people have been saying that uh, these fines are kind of like the red light camera fines and they are not. Um, they are different. And if you do not pay your fine, we have the ability to go to the Department of Revenue and put a vehicle registration hold on, on people's cars to, in order, it, until they pay um, their, their fines and tolls. Thank you. Commissioner Vasquez. Thank you for that. And I'm not sure if you'll, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I guess, and is that gonna be, will the camera capture that and then tickets will be issued? I'm asking, I'm driving um, 70 right now, and we just see cars coming in and out. 
yeah, um, yep. as, as it is right now. So that's yeah. why it's that. that. I'm not surprised you're seeing that, Commissioner Olgi. Uh, and I, I see it a lot too. And um, I, 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 you know, anecdotally, people tell me all the time, like, "Oh, I've seen people weaving." And um, yeah, we'll be doing a big public information campaign. Central Seventy will go live next month, and as we roll that out, um, not only will we be talking about tolling going live, but the safety enforcement program as well. Any. Commissioner Vasquez. Yeah, I really appreciated the conversation about how this is setting up like a line of credit. Um, and although there's a general feeling on the part of the CTIO board, we may not need all the 4 million, we should only do this once. And my question is, is the 4 million enough uh, for what you might see if your forecast is uh, overly enthusiastic? I. Um... I, you know, and this question is that Commissioner Stewart asked at the board meeting too. So um, you guys are like-minded on that. Uh, yet we hope to only do this once. I hope to have never have done this. Uh, this is my last board and commission meeting. And, you know, this is not one of the, one, the last thing I wanted to be doing on my way out the door. Um, but here we are. And... I think with the additional, and we talked about this as a staff, uh, you know, how do we, how do we minimize this? How do we not have to come back to see that and keep doing this? Because, I mean, we'd rather use toll revenue. Obviously, this is the way we we structured this is to never do this and have toll revenue support the the corridor, and um, and I think that's where we want to get back to. I think by pursuing the additional revenues through what I was telling, like new toll equipment. Um, the safety enforcement program, restructuring the debt, I think we can get to a good spot where, you know, it's either this year and done or this year and next year and done, and then we'll, we'll go back. It's the last item that concerns me in terms of restructuring the debt, whether that uh, can actually save uh, you money rather than not, you know, we, we don't know what the interest rate uh, oh, yeah, we, landscape yeah. is going to look like, right? Yeah, I mean, the interest rate is, environment has drastically changed since we closed. And I mean, we're not, you know, so there, I think there's different things we can do, you know, in terms of um, restructuring the debt. Commissioner Brackey. Mr. Chair, if I may, I, I, I just want to yes. explain, I, I just want to explain something for the entire commission, George Triple Attorney General's office. The problem with doing a bigger loan from a legal perspective under Tabor, CDOT and the Transportation Commission would have to encumber all of those funds in year one to not create a multi-year fiscal obligation. So if CTIO came to you and said, hey, we, you know, we need this big pool of money as a credit facility, CDOT would have to encumber that money all in year one and then allow, to allow CTIO to draw it down. So that that helps my the question because I had the same question. Is this a one time thing or is this going to be an annual ask? And when I look at the chart that you had on page ten or the slide of the the chart of the red line and versus the projection, I, I guess I understand you're going to have new projections done. But based on looking at this, what would those future years look like for the next five years, three years, that one? Because I don't see those lines. It's not like it doesn't look like they're going to cross anytime soon. So if it's not a one time thing, it's okay to say that, that this could be an ongoing thing. We can't do a larger amount for those reasons. But I think just being upfront about that, that this is um, a I would, delta say, that, I would say there's a good chance that we'd have to do this again next year. Yeah. Because but I mean, by my hope, and I think CTIO's hope is to not do it again next year. But I mean, we're going to try to do everything we can. But I just want to be upfront with you. Right. I, and, and that's and I think that's good. I just think it again, it would be helpful to just show this chart if this ended in February 23. You know, what does this look like for the remainder of the year? Or or how far out does it have to go before they meet? Because at least well, it seems like we're seeing on our travel patterns is that they are hitting a new normal, high or low, you know, whatever they are, they're not radically continuing to change. We've we're settling in. And so what does that look like over that forecasted time? So 
I don't have a problem doing this. I understand the why behind it. It just seems to me going to be something that's not going to be a one and done or a two and done looking at your chart. So to me, that would be helpful to convey as we go forward is that this is a, a trend we're going to be dealing with for, for CTIO and the commission will be dealing with for a while, which is okay. It's just we have to acknowledge what it is. Commissioner Stewart. Thank you. Those are good questions. Obviously, some of those were asked today at our meeting. A couple of things to bear in mind, I think, is that we have existing traffic and revenue numbers that now, uh, that were done prior to the pandemic. We're doing a new traffic and revenue so that we know what the new normal might be. And given those new numbers, we might be Im imposing other things in order to make sure that we don't have to come back over and over. One of those might be dynamic pricing talked about today, where we know what the threshold um, would be um, at certain times of the day, and we would capture those and then reduce it during the day when people don't need to use it so that we can maximize the amount of revenue we can get in at the right time. The other thing to remember, I think, is that it's a $4 million loan that we don't anticipate, we the board, I think, don't anticipate using $4 million in 2024. So the loan is there. And if we need to come back and take more money out of that 4 million and we haven't used it all, we'll have a cushion for a little bit of time and then we'll know what the new normal is. So I have to say uh, this, it reminds me of when uh, we built in Broomfield, we built the Northwest Parkway and we did traffic and revenue prior to 9-11. And we had a, re a relationship with Boulder County where we uh, purposely decided not to have um, access points along uh, the Northwest Parkway in order to protect open space that Boulder County had. And we agreed to all of that given traffic and revenue numbers. 9-11 comes along and no one's going to the airport. And things have changed dramat dramatically. And we don't meet our traffic and revenue numbers and we had to do something we were almost in technical default. And it's similar to that in that we're not in technical default, but we have to look at what we have today, regardless of what a, a year prior said to us. Um, we took a different route in the Northwest Parkway, but I'm really uh, supportive of this move forward with this loan, with the strategy attached to the loan. And that's what I wanna emphasize. There's a strategy so that we don't have to come back year after year. Mr. Hickey. Can you remind me at a high level, how is each section of the highway handled and are they distinct from one another? For example, South Gap, how is that gonna be uh, booked? Yeah, so under our statute right now, we, I, we can't, CTI cannot take revenue from the gap and use, use it to pay I, C470. I can't, Central 70, we can't take, so the money we earn on C470 is confined to the corridor. Um, and that's in our statute. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, and then related to this equipment, you do you have separate contracts for equipment for each yep. section too? And all? So we have a, a, a contract with a towing equipment provider for all of our express lanes. Um, their equipment. So before we used to use E470, um, E470 had a contract with a towing equipment provider out of California called, um, I, don't know, I forget what their name, Neology, near start with the net, Neology. Um, Neology, st when stopped, uh, told E470 and ourselves that they were going to stop making the equipment. And uh, that's 2019, we contracted with ETC a new towing equipment provider and their equipment is currently on Central 70, Westbound Mountain Express Lane and South Gap. And um, we'll be, as we finish opening up Central 70 and South Gap, we're gonna be replacing all of the Neology E470 equipment on C470, Eastbound Mountain Express Lane and I-25 North segments two and three with new equipment to minimize leakage. But C470 is we're prioritizing first is the is it wiser to be real conservative with your projections 
or not. For example, we, Commissioner Stewart just reminded us that 9-11 was a disaster, pandemic was a disaster, the climate change is gonna be a disaster every five years. And so we should be really conservative and yet does it, is that more costly over time? I think that the traffic and revenue forecast will play that out. And um, yeah, I think that's where you see lenders, you know, uh, take haircuts on the traffic and revenue forecast. And I think that's, that's what we did on C470. We took a, the lenders took a haircut on the forecast that we had. And I think that's what likely what um, lenders will do in this case as well, moving forward. Anything else? Questions? Oh, all right. Next okay. one, Jeff. All right. So I'll I'll be brief so you can move on to some discussion. Um, we'll be back on that item tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly uh, that in our budget supplement, we do have two items this month. Um, just to uh, check in to see if we have any questions. The first is a request to approve about 1.7 million in additional HSIP and hotspots funding um, to the I-70 Dowd Canyon Variable Signals Project in Region 3. Um, the second request in the supplement this month is a request from Region uh, 4 to reallocate uh, $6.8 million from one uh, rural pavement project to another rural pavement project um, that is deemed uh, a more critical and a higher priority. Uh, so just wanted to mention those two supplement items. If anyone has any questions, we can try to address those now. Uh, otherwise, I'll be back uh, to request approval of both the amendment and the supplement tomorrow. Yeah, I just wanted to point out on the shifting of rural pavement projects that came up in our TPR meeting and we approved moving it from Highway 71 to Highway 63 to just try to address part of the poor pavement that we're facing on all our other roads and trying to prioritize adding a shoulder or passing lane to at just trying to preserve the roadway. So that uh, was approved by our TPR to shift those funds. All right, anything else for Jeff or our team? If not, we'll, uh, Commissioner Hickey had asked that we have a round table for commissioners to bring up budget questions or ideas. Um, so I guess I'll let her kick it off and go from there. Sure, this is just one of my harebrained ideas. Um, sometimes we talk about budget things and kind of wish we had more time to follow up on that. Or, um, And I, as a newer commissioner uh, early on, just had so many questions that I never felt like I could ask. Um, but for example, we might, we have brainstormed about a rainy day fund for maintenance. And I thought this, we could take 10 minutes during each workshop to brainstorm about those types of things. We will not want to put pressure on staff to inform us a lot because they don't have opportunity to prepare for that. But I just wanted to see if we wanted that opportunity. I have a question, a specific question actually to lead off, which is, can you remind me, Jeff, what the 10 year plan projects number line 19, capital mobility, the EMT and staff approved adjustments of 341 million. Can you remind me what that is? Hard copies, and then I, I don't have one in front of me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'm sorry. What line were you talking about? 19. That 341.9 million. What's that adjustment? EMT and staff approved adjustments. Um, let's see. So, nine, nine, line 19, capital mobility. Um, let me see if I can find the other side of this. I think so. This is so the, the column itself is prior approved um, adjustments that were made at the EMT or staff level, which I'm stating the obvious here, but the question is specifically what makes up that 341? And I was trying to see is if that was a transfer, if those are transfers between the 10 year plan lines, because we have, um, we have several. And I'm breaking my own rule to not put pressure on staff. Uh, oh, so no, no, that's okay. It's a, welcome to come it's a really here. good question because it's a very large number and I'm trying to, um, 
think um, what that would have represented that, um, but I'll get you an answer. I don't think I have it off the top of my head. Okay. Other comments, questions on budget ideas or things we'd like to look at? Kathleen? Thank you for the idea to do this. It is nice to be able to just talk about things more in general versus specific um, changes. I, I guess similarly on line 38, there's a reduction of 4.9 million for strategic safety programs. And I was just curious about that and if it shows up somewhere else for safety. Just trying to think about again, our key priorities around um, sure. safety. and. So that one, I think I, I do have an answer and I think I might have an answer after thinking about a little more on the 10-year plan. On the strategic safety, what you're seeing when you saw the negative is that that actually was not um, taking dollars away from the strategic safety program. This is a little bit of a, of a technical feature, but a portion of the strategic safety program actually ultimately gets delivered by our maintenance forces. And so what ends up happening during the course of the year is you budget those funds to the strategic safety program, but a portion of them actually end up leaving that program and going over to John Lormay's budget to be, um, uh, to be delivered. So what you're seeing when you see a negative there is just simply it, it, at whatever month we had done that, there should have been a corresponding positive on MLOS, just shifting those dollars to the maintenance forces for the elements of the strategic safety program they deliver. Um, going back to the 10 year plan, and I, I will verify this to make sure I have this correct, but the thing I'm thinking that that EMT and staff approved adjustments is likely representing given the large magnitude is, um, I believe during the course of the year, we updated the budget to reflect the, um, additional amount received in the final Senate Bill 267 issuance above and beyond the base 500 million that we planned for. We also, I think, updated um, uh, to recognize interest accrued on our outstanding balances of 267 to date. And so there may be some other items in there that I'll have to verify, but I think a large portion of that, lar that, that um, EMT or staff approved adjustment was just truing up the Senate Bill 267 amounts after we've issued all of them. But I'll, I'll verify that and, and um, follow up on that just the same. Yeah, Eula. So I, I have a really high level question, Jeff. If we have a total plan, which I interpret when I look at this column called total FY23 program budget available, including changes of 3.618 billion. And then I look at the beginning, the roll forward from fiscal year 2021 to 2022. I guess the question is, what are the obstacles and the reasons we aren't able to spend all of the funds available to us when we get, because if, if I recall, every year we're gonna have a roll forward amount. Why aren't we able, what are the obstacles? Because if the intent here, yeah is to get the project done and work finished, we would expect that we should basically spend up about $2 billion a year. Correct. So, uh, so why aren't we able to spend it all? So the there's, I'll give you essentially two parts to this answer, to this question. One is that um, in general, you are right. If revenues are stable, right? If we basically have um, a, a, a relatively stable, level of funding on an annual basis, then what you would expect and hope for is that generally we, you know, we, we, we push out the door in, in all of our resources in a given year, right? And we don't have a lot of roll forward, rolling for, forward year over year. Um, exception might be things like wanting to hold a balance in, of contingency or reserve, et cetera. But in general, you're, you're correct. Um, what we've had happen in the last few years, however, is significant infusions of one-time funding. So we had about $600 million in additional funding per year for four years in a row under Senate Bill 267. And we had um, uh, uh, 
between various stimulus bills, um, somewhere around 400 million in upfront um, one-time funding. So you have such a large amount of one-time funding that was received over the course of a couple different legislative sessions. And this is not, I would say this is, what I'm describing is a phenomenon, I'd say across the country with DOTs, if not other units of government, that the amount of one-time funding um, exceeds capacity preparedness for um, DOTs to get out the door and deliver. And so I would say it's a combination of things. One, um, even just planning and programming takes time, right? So we don't usually, with that amount of money, um, we probably receive it and it probably takes us a, a not insignificant amount of time to just simply work through the decision process of how, how we're going to spend it. But then in particular, if they are not projects that are ready to go on the shelf, we might have a year or two of design right away, et cetera, before we really even get to the point of spending the construction dollars. So that you will see that come down as we sort of push that out over a couple of year period. The other piece I'll mention real briefly is the other big driver of roll forward um, is our local agency programs. We don't control that. Local agencies generally um, are, um, are I, I would say, have a bigger challenge than even the DOT does in terms of delivering program. And so it is sort of a um, ever-present feature that, that local agencies are slower to spend their money and we end up carrying some of those balances forward year over year. Those are the two biggest drivers. And, and the reason this is important to me is that as I think about this, with large roll forward balances and the absence of quote, either shovel ready projects or the ability to get money spent and done, inflation kicks in and the cost of projects that be otherwise okay actually become more expensive for us in terms of getting them done. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at numbers this big on the roll forward column, it worries me that as we get them done, it ultimately could cost us more than we otherwise anticipated a year earlier or two years earlier for same for same project. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, you know, and RTDs and and Keith and others can chime in here, but I think um, you know, one of the challenges, a good challenge to have, is that we've had, um, you know, we've had a lot of. Um, legislative infusions over the last several years. And even before that, we had a program called the RAMP program where we have sort of been operating in, in these shots in the arm that we get every year, every two years, but don't know are coming. That has been the history of the last 10 years almost, I'd say. I don't think that's the, I think we're stabilizing now because we're, we're Senate Bill 260 was sort of the, um, the, the, the fix, quote unquote, that I think, um, uh, takes the place of a lot of one-time legislative infusions. But I think we've had such um, uh, a, a history in recent years of infusions that it has also meant that we've sort of cleared the shelves. Um, and so what that means is, you know, we're getting to a point um, where we don't have a lot of projects ready on the shelf that we can just put out immediately tomorrow. And it's increasing the lag time between getting funds and probably when we've got a project that can really be out there delivering on construction. And I think we're doing things to try to to get get caught up, but again, good problem to have in that sense that we've been able to get so many projects done that we don't have a lot sitting on the shelf. But the flip side of that is it means it takes us longer. And I also am not in favor of seeing us just rush to get things done so we can get money spent down because we're, we're fortunate as opposed to some things at the federal level and other places where if you don't spend it, sometimes you can lose it. Right. So, so I like the notion here that at least we've got it, but I'm not in favor of seeing us rush to spend it because we, we, we're going to lose it. So I, I understand where it comes from, and I appreciate the explanation, Jeff. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, dumb question on the debt service line. So the roll forward and the budget for this year are the identical. How, how does that make sense? I'm line? sorry, it is line 70. The roll forward is identical. I'm not sure I'm following you. The 230.4 was the amount that rolled forward last year into this year. Right. And the total for the 2023 budget is the exact same number. Um, are you looking at the 
the first column in the column over to the far right. Correct. Yeah. The, the column over to the far right is just a total. So it's just totaling all the previous columns. So it, the, the, the only debt service budget in 23 is the 230 million that rolled forward. So there is no debt service for the- 20, So 2023 has an, any debt service? 20, 2023, you did not allocate additional funds to debt service. So the total amount of funds available, this is, um, let me explain this a little bit. Another unique feature of Senate Bill 260, um, it uh, pre Senate Bill 260, we had a general fund transfer in place, uh, annual general fund transfer to help us pay with Senate Bill 267 debt service. The Senate Bill 260 instead gave us a couple of our large upfront transfers to sort of front load our payments over multiple I years. I remember that now. So what that meant is, you know, to, to oversimplify, you have 230 million in the bank from the legislature. You didn't have to put aside more money for debt service in 23 because you're drawing down that upfront funding provided by the legislature. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for reminding me about that um, characteristic. Um, and then one more question, and that is on line 73. Um, so that there, there was 151 million uh, approved at staff or EMT level for commission reserve funds. So the, the question is what made up that 151, right? Correct. So the, ma the majority of that 151, so again, if, there's, if there are things that are in the EMT and staff approved column, it, it simply means that per PD 703, um, the P, that it means that PD 703 tells us how to allocate those funds we don't have to go to the commission and, and, and formally request approval. So per PD 703, there are certain types of funding that are um, essentially automatically routed to the program reserve. Um, the biggest one and, and what makes up the, a, a large part of that is the annual redistribution and our annual revenue reconciliation. So I couldn't tell you without pulling up more data exactly the, every every element of the 151, but I can tell you that the majority of that is the deposits we would have made into the program reserve per PD 703 um, when we conclude the year end roll forward and redistribution process, which is when we usually sort of re up the program reserve. Thanks. Others, Kathleen. Thanks. I just had a question about the um, enterprises on the back page for the clean fleet and for a non-attainment area. I know those are just getting started, but it more, it's more of a question about what the forecasts are for those. It looks like, um, you know, I know they're still starting, just starting to generate revenue, um, but there's the debt service and then the administration. I'm just curious kind of when, what the forecasted amounts would be for those enterprises that would be available for you know projects or programs sure sure so i can i can get you the exact number um uh, what i can tell you is um not the non-exact answer to that is that um the 8.3 million you see for clean transit and the 7.1 million for non-attainment so that that is essentially the first year of revenue collection for both of those programs mm -hmm. um that revenue collection does grow year over year as some of the fees phase in, um, but the first few years are pretty comparable to that. Off the top of my head, I would say probably 8.3 maybe goes to nine and 7.1 goes to eight, but that's generally the level you'll, you'll, that those enterprises will be at for the next um, couple of years, just growing a little bit year over year. Because those are both new enterprises and there's a lag in, in terms of getting organized, setting up, deciding how to spend those funds, you'll probably see those funds roll forward into next year. And so you, the, I would imagine in the case of both enterprises, the, the early years will be a little bit of catch up in getting those dollars out. Okay, you thank you. Uh, Jeff, if this were a different kind of entity other than a state transportation authority, and I looked at a budget and statements like this, I'd ask the question about what's missing and not included in this. And a good example from a private sector enterprise would be, we know that pension obligations and liabilities are not always 
reflected in the statement. Is there anything like that that's in our world that doesn't get reflected in this that could come before us mm -hmm. as an obligation? And, and I'm hoping the answer is this is pretty much all inclusive and there's yeah. nothing else out there. But I'm just asking the question kind of as a catch-all to make sure there's nothing that I don't understand that's outside of when I look at this 3.6 yep. billion is there is there something else that's not included in these numbers? Um, in general, I would say no. I think your your pension example is a great example. No, we do not have that here. We do not reflect sort of down at the agency level what's each agency's you know prorated share of sort of the unfunded liability of pension of para. Um, we um, you know I think you could say that there are um, you, you know there are some contingent liabilities with um, with uh, HPTE, the O and M loan, is an example. Um, now, that being said, those there's there is no um, there is no guarantee associated with that. That all of those, uh, as I use the term, contingent liabilities are at the the discretion of the commission. But there, you know, there are there is there is debt on the HPTE book that, in some cases, has a uh, provisions that uh, where the commission could be asked to come in and backstop. So um, I would say that. Um, I think within our budget document, I think we do have um, information on sort of all of our outstanding debt, um, but I'm not sure that, that that is fully clear there. But again, I would say that that it's is- not, um, it's, not, it's not anything that, you know, it's, it's like for people who are in other sectors, when, when I get to things like unfunded liabilities for pensions, it's a bigger number than most people would ever contemplate. Okay. So if you took it for the U.S. government, the federal government in terms of what our unfunded obligations are that aren't on the U.S. government's balance sheet today. I think the number is, is 30 trillion is what we think of as the debt. But if you think about the piece that's unfunded for other obligations, it's 100 trillion more. Correct. It's 130 trillion, which no one ever talks about, but it is a real obligation of the federal government. Correct. That, that's what I was getting at. Lisa. And then this really is a brainstorming question if we don't have any more about the budget this year. And that is when I first came on, it was soon after the census. And I recall a conversation or two where I asked whether the advisory group should incorporate the census figures and it was kind of too late because. So my question will be not to answer today so much, but to think about maybe for the next month until our next such session where are there advisory committees that should be reconvened to respond to the census now that we're well into the next decade, which maybe every five years they should be. And I'm thinking of the MMOF advisory committee specifically. Within, I just, I would think part of that would be our next planning cycle because they're kicking that off. So I, Yes, that would be. Yeah, but that's it's more background about the allocation formulas that would be implicated by what I'm maybe misreferring to as the advisory. They they redo the allocation formulas every so often. Yes, and I I think what you're referring to is the what we call the program distribution process. Um, and so um, I I think actually that um, we've we've had a few was actually this past stack meeting, I think was one of our first. So we are starting the, what we call the program distribution process with stack and it will be coming to you. Um, but what we do in the program distribution process is we go through all of the formula, all of the programs that have uh, a, a formula that is set ultimately by the commission, right? So in other words, the, the, so we have, um, you know, off the top of my head, let, let's call it seven or eight programs. I think that's in the right ballpark that have some sort of a distribution methodology that is ultimately approved by the commission. We revisit every planning cycle, those formulas with the stack. And, you know, we say, do we keep it the same, but just update the data inputs? Do we um, develop a new formula? Do we tweak the formula, et cetera? Um, we have just started that process. We're gonna be working through all of those programs with the stack over the next, uh, I think really up through fall. And then we'll be coming to the commission to update you on those discussions with stack and also to bring to you what 
um, the, the recommendations are for those formulas. So I think that is coming uh, to commission. Um, it's just starting uh, with the planning partner input at stack. All right, I'll verify if that's um, what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. Sure. Any others? Um, just one thing I wanted to mention to be looking at for the next budget is um, with doing our 4P meetings and um, the discussion about the funding for our bridges that are having stress cracks and, and those things is trying to find funding to increase our structure uh, maintenance um, and preservation um, culverts and bridges specifically like region four. Um, I have about 4,000 bridges in region four and about over 12,000 culverts. Um, the st structures get, or the bridges get about 6.5 million for doing preventative maintenance and those things. Um, when you look, think about 4,000 bridges, that's not very much money. Um, and same thing with culverts, 1.2 million for over 12,000. Um, so those are things that I think as we move through the budget, if we can find ways to start increasing the amount we're putting into the preventative and, and preserving what we have out there, we're seeing culverts get washed out with the high water flows. As I drove in, almost every creek has ran out east this year, which is unusual. So you have all that debris and things that are up against the structures now that we need to be made aware of and make sure that things aren't getting washed out and, and the repairs that may be needed. So we've had bridge enterprise that has been replacing bridges. They're supposed to start taking over maintenance, which over time, as that proceeds, we're going to see reduced money available for mate or re reconstruction of failing bridges that will need to be spent on maintenance. So those funds have helped us a lot, but we're starting to get to that age of structures and things that we're gonna have to be spending more in bridge enterprise to maintain. And we need to make sure that our portion of the existing bridges that have not been transferred are being maintained. And the budget numbers have not changed much for many years. So I think that's one of the key factors for resiliency and preservation of our system. We need to be looking at any ways we can increase that funding to preserve our system. Just like we did in our Eastern TPR, we took away improvement projects to just to try to preserve failing pavement. So, you know, uh, sometimes Jeff, some sometimes you don't always uh, in the finance and accounting area don't always get a lot of uh, encouragement and and support and indications of appreciation. But I just want to say for the record and for everyone, first of all, I think you guys do an excellent job. In, in your group, in your area, and Bethany in particular, I, I think, you know, you always come so prepared with much more data and much more insight than we can possibly consume and manage. And I, as one commissioner, just wanted to say thank you. So it, it's appreciated from my end. Well, well, thank you. And I will, I will take that back to Bethany and her team. Um, they really do a, a great job in, uh, in preparing our, our materials and managing our budget. So. Thank you for that. All right, since we're getting behind schedule now, we'll move on to our audit committee. I'll turn it over to Eula to call the audit committee to order. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Eula Adams. I'm the commissioner for uh, District uh, 3, which is Arapahoe and Douglas County. And today, I, I, as we, we'd like to convene our audit committee meeting, and uh, I don't have much in terms of editorial comments for today's meeting. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Frank uh, Spinelli, who is going to carry us through our meeting. And Frank, I assume you will introduce your team and team members who are present. And then uh, you'll take us through your presentation for the audit committee. On, and then we'll, I guess, adjourn the audit committee and we'll turn it back over to the chair. But please, Frank, it's... Thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Adams. Um, um, I'll introduce my, introduce my team um, as we get to a couple slides uh, into into it, um, and and so let's just uh, get on with the with the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so the agenda um, is is the call to order. Thank you, um, Commissioner Adams, and then 
uh, the motion to approve the minutes of our March 15th, 2023. Um, Thank you. Your mic is on. Yes, it is. All right. There you go. Thank you. Um, the external, uh, Robin is here. Robin Lamb is here. She'll present the audit, um, external audit team results and plan. Um, Jim uh, Ballard is here. He'll uh, talk about the financial security and the peer review. Next slide, please. So um, I asked the ARC for the uh, motion to approve the uh, the March 15, 2023 minutes. Commissioner so, Stewart moved to approve. Could we get a second? I'll second that. Okay, it has been moved and it's second. So please consider our minutes from the March 15, 2023 meeting approved. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. I think um, we have to vote on that. Okay, let's vote. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by the usual sign. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Next slide, please, Jim. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Robin Lamb and Jim Ballard. Um, without these two individuals, um, nothing would be done in the uh, in the audit uh, audit division. I, I appreciate their help and and the team underneath them. Um, you know, again, the work that they do uh, provides value for CDOT, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm very happy uh, that 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 they're the audit division team. I'm very proud of them. Thank you. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Robin. She'll introduce her team as the as they're presenting their uh, the information or the uh, material that they work on. Um, and this will be a good test to me to see how quiet I can stay. Hi, so I'm Robin Lamb. I'm the external audit manager of the external team within the internal audit division. And on the next set of slides, we're going to go through um, where we're at in fiscal year 23 regarding the project types that we perform, the work that we perform, and how many products we're completing. So this first slide shows you as of June 7th, which is when we kind of finalized our numbers, we do work in seven main focus areas. Um, the majority of our work is done for the end of the fiscal year. We do have a few areas, which include our master pricing agreements and our subrecipient monitoring, where we'll still have a little bit more work through the end of the year. But as you can see, um, for seven major types of focus areas that we perform, we're issuing a lot of products through the fiscal year. And I use the word products versus projects because our subrecipient monitoring project is a one-year cycle where we're monitoring approximately 180 subrecipients through that full year. So I include that as more of a product type than a project. So I'm going to go on. To, Robin, a subrecipient in this indication means? Means CDOT gets the federal funding. They pass it on to local agencies, nonprofit organizations, transit agencies, things like that, to use the money. Yeah. So that's what a federal subrecipient is. So it's is. not just the projects that we, CDOT, commission and contract. Right. It, it actually extends out, and you're looking at projects that a nonprofit organization that we might give money to or participate in a project they're doing that you're actually looking through to see how that money is used by that subrecipient, how they are managing and monitoring it. So we do a very limited sampling of that. The, the majority of the work that we perform is to ensure that if the subrecipient needed a federal single audit, that they got that done, we review it and I don't want to take Kyle's uh, slide away from him because he's going to get into that information a little bit more. But yes, uh, we'll, we'll wait for Kyle to talk about that. And then if you have any further questions, we can move into that. Um, any questions on just our estimated number of products at year end or where we're at right now? So this next slide kind of breaks, it essentially just breaks down um, where we're spending our time and what work we're performing. So the percent of our hours, um, you can see in that first chart, the majority of our work time is on direct project hours, which is what we should be doing. We shouldn't be spending a lot of time on administrative activities. We do have some administrative activities that we perform. I'll just touch on a few of them. Um, other administrative tasks, you know, that's just your general emails, um, non-project specific meetings that we have with either stakeholders or external stakeholders or internally. 
um, consulting activities that might be conducting trainings for various CDOT divisions or um, participating in monthly transit meetings, things like that that they have. And, and Robin, just mm -hmm. as an old guy who used to think about life in these terms, how many total hours does do these charts indicate? Is it 8,000 hours, 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours? Exactly how much effort are you talking about when I see something that says percent of direct project hours broken down by all the different areas, but I can't say is, this a, is that a 30,000 hour chart, which for me would be seven mm -hmm. people, right. or is it something else? So I don't, so, I don't know how to turn it into something I can make heads or tails of. Right, and great question. So we currently have six staff and myself. So multiply that by approximately 2,000 hours or so, right? And um, all the staff are sitting down there and I'll introduce them as they, we get through this next slide. Um, any other questions on that percent of hours time? The CPE one, since I, I didn't actually put the wording out there, that's our continuing professional education that we must meet in order to uh, meet requirements of generally accepted auditing standards. And so we, each staff person has to obtain 80 hours of continuing professional education, typically in auditing, government, that type of thing, um, over a two-year period. And we typically try and get each person at least 40 hours a year. Um, if no questions on that chart, the next chart is really where, again, the percent of our time is spent by the specific project types that we perform. So the majority of the work we perform is on based on hours is in our master pricing agreement reviews or MPA reviews. And Josh will talk more about those and get into the details of that. Um, that's primarily because of the number that we do. We do almost 200 reviews a year. So a lot of our time is spent in that area. Um, the local agency and direct cost rate reviews, subrecipients monitored, and our advanced vehicle payment reviews. Kyle Oliveria leads that area, and he'll talk more about those. Those are that's kind of the rest of our normal routine work that we know we're going to get every year. And the dispute and claim reviews, we get those as requested by management for us to uh, review a construction claim that's filed against CDOT and um, Andrew Wiseman will talk more about that as well as our sole source and single bid reviews that he leads. And then our last area will be um, India Easley and Sam Nero will talk about um, some cybersecurity activities that we'll be performing upcoming. So, mm -hmm. comes to audit and accounting stuff, everybody doesn't always appreciate. What I get from this is you're telling me from the investment we put in audit services, 80%, about 80% of what you do is actually going to actually making sure that our dollars that we're spending are being spent as intended. Correct. A lot Thank of the you. work we perform is kind of proactive. So with the master pricing agreements, we're looking at rates before people start or before the consultants start contracting with CDOT so that that's already established at time of contracting. And that also is an efficiency purpose. And, and my experience about it is in a good outfit, even a large public accounting firm, 75 percent of their effort going towards actual doing work is a pretty good number. Mm -hmm. So this yep. is this is a good result. And I'm just saying this for people in the room who may not understand this part of it. This is where value for us comes in with what you're doing is 80% of your effort is actually going at looking at our people doing what we contracted mm -hmm. with them to do. Right. Okay, so I will pass it on to Josh Gosinka. Oh, oh I'm sorry. All right, thank you. A quick question. Do you guys audit any uh, fiber leases or P3 leases in regards to our fiber optic asset? We have not on the external side, and that would be maybe a potential internal audit that could be performed in the future, but we haven't done anything on our external side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we move into Josh's slide? All right, uh, so my name is Josh Gosenka. Uh, I lead the master pricing agreement reviews. Um, so the master pricing agreement or the MPA 
is the document that outlines the rates that um, can be charged by engineering firms on the CDOT professional services contracts. Um, so it's primarily myself and one other auditor uh, doing these reviews, and then Robin Lamb is doing the uh, quality control on those. Uh, so our objective for those reviews is to make sure that the engineering um, firms are in compliance with the federal regulations, uh, primarily 48 CFR Part 31, which is uh, commonly referred to as the FAR, and then 23 CFR 172. So as part of our reviews, we're looking at the direct salary rates of the firms, uh, making sure that they're matching their payroll registers and that the rates they're charging are reasonable. And then also the indirect cost rates um, to make sure that only allowable costs are included in those rates. We do uh, about 200 reviews a year. Uh, the reviews take on average five to eight um, actual working hours um, over the course of 12 to 17 calendar days. And that's with a lot of back and forth with the firms. Uh, so far this year, as of June 7th, we've done uh, over 22,000, or we've made hourly adjustments of over $22,000, and we're on pace to probably make between 23 and 24,000 uh, in hourly adjustments. We estimate that those adjustments save uh, CDOT somewhere between $2 million and $7 million a year, and that is uh, trending upwards uh, over the past five years or so. Uh, so did anybody have any questions on any of that? Yes. So does trending upward mean the contractors aren't billing accurately? No, no. So this uh, has nothing to do with if they're billing accurately or not. Um, it's the majority of our adjustments are for the uh, reasonableness of the hourly rates that they're charging. So we're saying, you know, they're saying maybe an engineer is being paid by them $60 an hour. We're saying for that level of engineer, it's more reasonable to pay $55 an hour. So then we're coming to an agreement to make an adjustment down that they'll only charge $55 an hour for that level of engineer. Yep. Uh, Josh, I interpret the, the savings as being, you know, admittedly a sample, mm -hmm. but by actually imposing and identifying these opportunities, these are real dollar savings with the contractors if you are able to sit down with them and to get them to agree that they're overcharging us based on the market. Exactly, it's it's definitely an estimate for the, the total amount, but there are real dollars being saved. Um, the estimate comes in in that we don't know, we can't predict how that individual would have charged throughout the next year. So um, we make a few assumptions on that. That's where those five, 10 and 15% come. You know, if he spent 5% of his working hours on the project, it would have resulted in this amount of savings. And my experience has been, if you are gaining a reputation as an organization called CDOT that is really holding your contractors accountable for making sure the benefits that we receive are far in excess of that because people will eliminate the practice. Yeah, and we have seen that too with uh, some firms. They, they've they started um, leaving off their, their extremely high high paid people and and putting in more reasonably priced people. We've also had other DOTs ask about um, how we do these reviews so that they can start implementing it uh, in their practices as well. Is there any consequence for uh, negotiating that lower rate in terms of the quality of the work that's done? Um, I can't say that for sure. I don't think there is. Um, they, these firms still have to be qualified and uh, the engineers still have to be licensed. They have to have the, the experience and the capabilities to perform the work that they're performing. Um, so this is just saying we're not gonna pay exorbitant amounts for a particular employee. No hundred dollar hammers. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully or, not, unless or, it's a very, very good hammer. Or golden toilet seats. Uh, but my, <laughs> often the higher uh, rate is associated with increased experience. Yes. And, and we that's take, why I'm asking the question. Oh, yeah. And we do take that account into our, our testing. Uh, for example, if you know, we, we have a, a set limit that we'll say for like an engineer four, a high level engineer four, um, based on them having a certain number of years experience. If there's a, another employee who's still at the engineer level four, but has 10 or 15 years more experience, we'll take that into consideration and approve a higher rate for that type of person because of that additional years of experience. 
Yep. Yep. Any other thing else? I just wanted to see if Josh could talk about the second component just quickly. You know, a lot, obviously the majority of our adjustments are in the direct salary side, but we also review the indirect cost rates that they want to charge on top of those direct salaries. And we make adjustments in that case too. Do you guys have any questions on the indirect cost rate side? Yep. How much does that vary around the state? Uh, sorry, what do you mean? That rate that you're like looking the at is the very oh, uh, between... Western Slope to Metro area. Um, it, it wouldn't vary based on, on region. Um, different firms have different indirect cost rates. Uh, so there's, and it's kind of, I would say the, the range is somewhere between 100 and 200%, I would say is, is the range with most of them falling around the one 160%. And it, it can be from a variety of factors, just um, how a firm is set up. Some firms uh, have higher direct costs and um, can their overhead more in check, some firms to hire overhead. Uh, so that can be part of it. It can be part um, the efficiency of the firm. Some firms are just more efficient. Um, sometimes a firm will have a higher rate because they bring on some people expecting to get a project, but then that project may, may not come to fruition. They may not get it. So now they're stuck with a lot of employees that are maybe not directly charging on projects as much. You triggered another question. So the CDOT rate, any of these uh, companies that are more efficient than others, or does that factor into any bidding or, you know, I, you just triggered more thoughts with that reply. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. Yeah. Since it's, since um, we're dealing with engineering firms that have it's qualifications based um, where we can't, you know, disqualify anybody for having high rates or anything like that. But um, I would imagine it's taking into, into consideration when uh, contracts are writing contracts. Um, as far as we go, uh, we, there, there's no, the Fed, Federal regulations don't allow us to just say, here's a limit. We, we can't, this firm can't have, you know, higher than a 200% rate, um, but it is limited. They are limited to the types of costs they can include in those rates. Uh, so we're checking their indirect cost rates to make sure that only those allowable costs per the federal regulations are included. And if they're including any unallowable costs, we're removing those costs and, and reducing their rates. Mm -hmm. The questions of Josh. Uh, Frank, we've got about, according to the calendar, we were scheduled to be breaking in about 15, but I think we started about five or 10 late. So what else do we have on the agenda to cover? So we have about four other areas to talk about real quick. So if you guys don't have a lot of questions, they'll go very quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so Kyle Oliveria, we'll talk about the next three slides. All right, um, my name is Kyle Oliveira. Um, first area I'm going to talk about is our local ind uh, local agency indirect cost rate reviews. Um, so these are very similar to uh, what Josh was talking about, the MPAs, but these specifically are for local government and nonprofit agencies that are getting subrecipient grants. Um, so what we do is we annually will approve their indirect cost rate. Um, typically what we um, get for these, we have a, a set package that they need to submit to us. Um, and essentially this is to cover their administrative and overhead fees. Um, the, the guidance that we utilize for this is a 2 CFR 200. Um, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that guidance. Um, but essentially it covers all of our single audit um, reviews as, as well as the uh, calculation of indirect cost rates. Um, and then these we do on behalf primarily of Department of Transit and Rail, uh, Department of Transportation Development and the various regional business offices. Um, and every year we do about 12 to 14 of them. It just depends on um, if a lot of these are getting annual um, updates on their projects versus just one-time projects. Um, usually we do uh, a risk-based approach on these. So we do go through uh, on our planning phase, determining if one is higher risk. Uh, they've had it, 
errors in their calculation in the past um, versus low risk, which is you know, fairly straightforward for us to do a review. Um, and then typically, if we do have an adjustment, it's usually in the range of or area of uh, unallowable costs. So sometimes in their calculation, they accidentally are including an area that is not allowed per the federal regulations. So we usually will bump that out and walk through them and explain why this is incorrect. And they um, will then make an adjustment accordingly. Any questions on local agency and direct cost rate reviews? I don't have any questions, but thank you. It, it's really important stuff. It, it, it doesn't get a lot of highlight and headlines, but even communicating to people that we're doing this and making sure they know, I hope we're publicizing it and putting it in the newsletter and other things about CDOT so that people who are subrecipients understand that we're looking at what they're putting into their indirect pool so that they're not overcharging it. So thank you. Yeah. Um, the next slide um, is covering the single audit subrecipient sub, uh, sub monitoring activities. Um, and so here, what we do, um, I mean, obviously the subrecipient process is a, is a quite large, uh, the monitoring process is a, a large area that's covered by both DAF um, and local agency coordinators themselves. And then our portion is to essentially review um, single audit reports that are submitted annually. Um, the, the guidance again for this goes back to 2 CFR 200 um, and single audits are required um, for any agency that receives $750,000 in total in federal expenditures. And that is from all different agencies, not just CDOT. Um, and then those reports need to be submitted within nine months of fiscal year end. And so what that means for us is usually most of ours have a 1231 year end. Um, so September is usually when we are the busiest with these. We typically receive um, like 180 um, over the period of the year, um, some throughout the year, but the majority in September. Um, and typically we, if we do find that there are findings um, per the audit report, um, we uh, will reach out to them and follow up on what have they done to make corrections. Um, and then we were that report that um, overall to, um, uh, we summar we create a summary. To report. Division of accounting. Yeah, finance. division of accounting. Finance. Um, right, I think. Okay. So quick question. If there are 178 of them, we only get the two or three per year. I assume that the vast majority of them, if they're getting seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars of funds, that they are subject to some sub single audit requirement. So I'm assuming, just for the sake of everyone's information here, a lot of that one seventy eight are being audited by someone, and so it's not that they're going unlooked at. We're just not the ones. We're just taking a sample of yep. the total because of limited resource. Yeah, so that 60% is, um, of that 178, about 60% get a single audit done by an external auditor. So we don't need to put in all of that additional work in redoing what's already been done. Um, these firms have all gone through peer review. Uh, they, they have to meet certain standards. So for us, we're just doing a summary and then follow up. And then the exempt subrecipients, so any that are only receiving uh, an amount below 750,000, we will take a sample um, of two to three per year um, total that we end up doing a review. And what we typically do is we take a look at CDOT's documentation. So whatever department, whether that's um, transit and rail, DTD, highway safety office, um, we request that they provide what information they have gathered um, and what monitoring that they've been doing. And then we're determining whether they've met the criteria um, for that, that specific federal program. And then what is, has CDOT maintained all the documentation that they should be uh, maintaining? And you're correct. We do two to three projects a year because we just don't have the staff resources to be able to do all of the remainder of them. So we, we take a lot of judgmental professional expertise and looking at which ones we should be reviewing. And Robin, I'm glad to know because I didn't understand the depth of what you're doing with this. So I'm glad to see that we're doing it. So thank you. 
Um, and the final area that I work on is advanced vehicle payment reviews. Um, so this is a CDOT um, uh, program that was developed by DTR, um, Department of Transit and Rail, uh, and started in 2014. Um, they established the eligibility and documentation requirements um, for an advanced vehicle purchase. And then in 2019, they updated their program to include um, our division as a additional review step. Um, so typically what we do is uh, normally re, uh, federal grants are reimbursed on a uh, reimbursement basis. So they have to have spent the money first, then they get a check. Um, and occasionally there are times where some of these small uh, transit organizations don't have the funds to uh, upfront the money and then get reimbursed. So there's a certain list of criteria um, that we look at. And it, if we've determined that indeed they look like they should be eligible, we can do a, an advanced payment um, cut to them. Uh, so for us, we just issue a memo to DAF, just say, or not DAF, but DAF and uh, DTR um, stating that they are good to go. Uh, they have met the, the threshold. And we typically only do about two or three of these in a year. Um, it just depends on the ebb and flow of when vehicles are being requested. Yeah, yeah, just a dumb question. So this is to enable small agencies to be able to buy electric buses? Yeah, uh, either electric or um, or traditional buses for their transit division. Um, I'm not sure exactly, you know, the nature of all of the agreements, but we look specifically at certain eligibility requirements, like what their annual tra transit budget looks like, what does their cash flow typically look like, um, you know, if, if they're not going to be able to upfront the money. Um, and then we also require they have a process in place in order to quickly make that payment back out so that they're not just sitting on an advance payment for a month or two. They've got a few days to make that. Okay, so advance doesn't mean advance vehicles. It means an advance. An advance of funds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Correct. A lot of these transit agencies use this as um, like to buy a bus to take seniors around it. to their doctor's I was assuming stuff. it meant uh, okay. <laughs> okay. a different technology. I mean, some of them may be advanced. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's it for me. So, okay. So, Andrew Wiseman, can you go quickly through this slide? <laughs> The Andrew Wiseman push. The, yeah. <laughs> when I think it I comes think, to mind. I think he was an auditor of Enron or something like that. But lawyer, yeah. <laughs> not not related. <laughs> um, so my main role is construction disputes and claims. And during these reviews, we focus on the quantum value, uh, which involves reviewing all supporting documentation related to the claim dispute as provided by the contractor. Dispute is an issue in which the contractor and CDOT have not been able to resolve and for which the contractor submits a written formal notice. A claim um, is a dispute not resolved at the resident engineer level or resolved after a DRB recommendation. Since 2016, we've completed 11, five being disputes and six claims. There's two main types of costs, direct and indirect. So some examples of an, a direct cost would be a machinery, additional machinery, or an increased cost in material. Um, and then you guys can see the that first table, uh, approximately $65 million has come through since 2016 in these disputes or claims. And our audit adjustments was approximately 50%. So just a little over $30 million. There's also indirect costs. So some examples of that would be um, internet, utilities. These are all time related. These are costs that are directly related to an extension of time that the contractor did not expect to be on the job site. And typically the number of days has not been agreed upon yet. So we focus on the daily rate calculation. So that second table shows that and shows three examples of projects that we worked on um, where a claimed daily rate was submitted. So that in that first example, $7,500 a day, $7,530. And we made adjustments um, based on 
the documentation they provided. And some examples of some findings that we've had were just lack, a general lack of supporting documentation, such as timesheets, mileage logs, invoices. We found mathematical errors and also contractors, including um, categories that are not time related. So are there any questions on that? Thank you very much. So I'm just trying to understand sort of at a high level, you're reviewing claims that have been resolved internally internally or not yet resolved? Not yet resolved. And so you're, you, um, will you review all claims? Or are there some that you won't review? I think you probably said that, but I'm so. Yeah. So these are only the claims or disputes that have come to us. There used to be a certain threshold dollar amount before it would come to audit. Now it's more open-ended um, regarding which ones can come to us. So we get notice from project personnel that, hey, there's a claim or dispute coming down the pipe. Um, be prepared. You know, we expect it at this point in time. So we don't know when they're coming, how much they're going to be, anything like that. And then... Is what you're finding something you can package to distribute so that it can inform response to claims other than those that you review? Not necessarily. Um, I know we have talked with project personnel about some of the findings that we're having based on the claims, but it's not a packaged document or anything like that. But, but my hope would be that you can help inform so that we can uh, resolve similarly uh, mm -hmm. across the board. But and actually, I, I take that back. We did send a memo at one point to Shoshana, the executive director, um, just letting her know, hey, we're, we're noticing some of these issues. It's, it's something that should be discussed. Great. I think that was a couple years ago. Good work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin, why would we have, as an organization, because I'm certain this is not an internal audit decision, why would we have gotten rid of a threshold for disputes to say before we would agree to the dispute? Is there another dispute resolution process within CDOT? There's and a significant. What is that dispute resolution process? I don't have time to do that in two minutes, but there is a very thorough dispute resolution process. It's outlined in the standard specifications for road and bridge construction. There's a section on that. Um, there's a dispute review board that before it becomes a claim, it'll go to dispute review board um, where they're looking at both the merit and potentially the quantum. We do not audit, audit does not get involved in the merit of the issue, only the quantum side of it. So this is going to be between Keith Stepanek's group and Jeff's group, I would assume, would be involved in that. Yeah, uh, Keith Stepanek. So we have in our construction specifications on all of our construction projects, <clears throat> we have a dispute resolution process. So some of those uh, disputes are handled at a project level. Some are handled at an RTD level. Some come up, up to me. So there's certain thresholds that we go through um, to try to resolve those. We, we want to avoid disputes and claims as much as possible, but there are times where both sides do not agree. Um, it goes through that process. Uh, typically, in turn, uh, audit is involved when it gets to the claim process. And that's really my concern is to make sure that there's as robust a process for getting through it, even if the audit group is not involved. But one of the things I would suggest that I'd love to see as a commissioner is if, if there's another dispute resolution process, I would love for the audit group to at least give us some feedback at some point on that, that process and how eff effective and the level of efficacy of it, not to try and redo their work or be involved in it, because I'm perfectly happy with what uh, Keith and, and Jeff and the members of that group are doing, but I think it would be helpful for the commission and for me as a chair of the audit committee to say, well, we're not looking at all the disputes because we have an alternative process, but I'd at least like for someone from the audit group to tell me, commissioner, don't worry about the other disputes that we're not looking at, even though it's 300 million or $500 million, you know, that someone is touching it and we're getting 499 million of, of it thrown out because they're doing such a good job. So if someone, if, if you guys get that would be. We will do that. Okay, what was next on the, uh, in the back? 
So the second area that that, um, yeah, well, just one more quick slide here. So we do sole source reviews and single bid pricing reviews as well. Sole source reviews required on any proposed pricing over 250,000 and single bids are just reviewed as requested. We've only performed or we've only reviewed one single bid since 2019. And just a few examples of um, sole sources that have come through LED variable message, message signs and servicing. So it's a unique thing. Um, proprietary software for the central I-70 project and an infrastructure study uh, involving alternatively powered aircraft um, by the uh, Division of Aviation. So these are just unique, unique scenarios. So this is essentially competition hasn't been determined yet, or there is no competition. So you can't determine that the price is fair and reasonable. So they get audit involved to help you looking at that. Nothing on my end. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So that's it for the external team's work. Um, we have a couple more slides, one on cyber cybersecurity, financial security controls, and then peer review, if you guys have time. Yeah, but Joe, uh, here, we do want to be okay. We hear about cyber defenses, so we want to hear about this. So, okay. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Samuel Nuro, and I'm part of the STEM. I'm kind of a hybrid between uh, external and internal. And I'll be talking about the ongoing cyber initiative, ACIDA. So I have a few stats to give you to, uh, to talk about. Uh, according to cyber commands, in 2022, the average cost to business affected by, by cyber security breach in the United States was about 8.6 million, up 35% from 2015 and compared to the average uh, global number is more than double. So what's CEDAW doing to get ahead of the curve when it comes to cybersecurity issues? CDOT in conjunction with OIT is rolling out a new uh, cybersecurity management system that would track all our uh, POS and uh, our uh, asset management like uh, writers, computers, and software, and everything of that nature. So this does not only affect CEDAW, it also affects our contractors. Any contractor that does business with CEDAW and has access to CEDAW account must also take CEDAW OIT training as well. Do you have any other questions for me? And so India Easley, who is our newest staff member, Thank is going to go over the second bullet here. Um, she just started on May 22nd, so we are now fully staffed in the external team. I'm very happy about that. And welcome aboard, by the way. Thank you. What can CDOT do? Continue to be diligent with cybersecurity awareness training and follow best security practices. Continue adapting a defense in-depth approach with end-to-end -end security measures from the cloud all the way down to protecting critical operational assets which should include both portable media security and network, network segmentation. Periodically conduct third-party security assessments to determine threat levels and cybersecurity health. Follow up with OIT to ensure with, that these new processes and best practices are operating effectively. Our office understands the importance and high nature of this area. Our division is dedicated to putting forth staff resources Therefore, Sam and myself are in the process of reviewing and receiving additional certifications regarding cybersecurity. Any questions? So maybe not for you directly, great information, but we had personal information get hacked through, I think, OIT. It's not this group, is that correct, Jeff? So I think what you're maybe referring to was not a hacking incident, but it was the, are you referring to the 1099s? where we had um, 
that, that was not actually OIT. That was the uh, Department of Personnel and Administration. And, uh, and what happened is they, they made an error in mailing out 1099s. So it actually wasn't a cyber, um, a cyber incident. Okay, listen, terrific. I think that's very informative. I appreciate it um, from your whole team, Frank. So I'm gonna turn it back to you. Did you have any closing comments? Well, if you can do them quickly, I know everyone's really interested in getting to the break and we don't want to be in their way as, as people have to go to the break. Starting with the old, hey, by the way, starting with the oldest guy in the room. So, <laughs> so go ahead, please. And so we recently had a peer review and that's something we pay attention to with regards to quality in all our work, whether it be the internal side or the external side. But we recently had a peer review. The good news is we passed. We not only passed, but uh, I think okay. Okay. How's that? Is that a little bit better? So the results of the peer review were that we passed and we passed without any deficiencies. So it's equivalent to what probably Eula realizes has an unqualified audit opinion if we were doing a financial audit. So um, the peer review process looks at you know, how many training hours that the staff has along with other quality measures. So they spend about a week and it's a team that's outside of the audit division. It's another C, it's another transportation uh, department that comes and conducts that peer review. So that's all I have with that. So we passed. As Frank. Yeah, Chair Adams, that's the end of our presentation. If um, you'd like to um, exit the meeting. Any other uh, we have a question from Commissioner Garcia. Well, thanks for the information. I was just on my earlier question about auditing our fiber leases and P3 agreements related to fiber. You said maybe an internal review or something. I, I, I'm interested in that and I'm not sure how to move that forward. Um, I'll have a conversation with um, Bob Pfeiffer, um, speak to him about what's involved. And, um, I, you know, we can do a preliminary um, just evaluation on those leases and, and come back and report to you. And certainly I, I think that's a TC decision. It, if it shouldn't just be mine, but if the TC feels, you know, that's a worthy work effort, certainly um, I would like to see that move forward. The the initial effort wouldn't be significant. So it, 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 it. Uh, Commissioner Stewart and Commissioner Hart, before we adjourn our audit committee, do you have any comments or observations for our audit uh, audit team? No, I don't have anything else. Just thank you very much. Very good presentation. Much appreciated. I learn more every time you guys come. Thank you. We appreciate it. It's a great team. I, I'd just like to echo that same comment, Commissioner Hart. I, I think that uh, from where we are now with respect to our communications and comments and the time we're taking to understand and listen to what's going on with by the audit group is very, very helpful to me as a commissioner. So I greatly appreciate all the work that you guys are putting in and all the time that I get to spend with you. And I do learn something every time I sit down with you. So thank you very much for all that you do. That I'll turn it back over to, uh, well, I, I guess I would call for a motion to adjourn our audit committee meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, it has been moved and second. All in favor of the adjournment? Aye. So uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Beatty, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. All righty. Um, do we need a break? Wanna take 10 minutes? for five minutes. I'll say five minutes, be back by 10. <laughs>
Okay, Darius. Thank up. you, Chair. Uh, appreciate the time today. So we're here to talk about updates uh, to Policy Directive 1610, which outlines the procedure for implementation of the greenhouse gas uh, planning standard. Um, in today, we're going to be talking about three uh, changes, which are uh, language clarification to help users of the PD um, internally and externally update of, of the review date and um, uh, updated figures for the five transit mitigation measures. So with that said, I would like to introduce Libba Rawlings, who's a, a greenhouse gas specialist within the Division of Transportation Development, and she's going to go through these changes in detail today. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so as Darius just clarified, there are three key changes that we're proposing to PD 1610. One, we have simplified some of the vocabulary that's used throughout the PD to provide more clarity. So previously, um, greenhouse gas mitigation measures were given a number of points, um, which was confusing to say, because what we really meant by that was tons of greenhouse gas um, reduced. So we've now changed everywhere where it says points to say tons reduced. Um, previous slide, please. Great. And then also um, everywhere where we said metric, we have changed it to unit because it's just a more common term to describe what we mean. Um, and again, this was just done in effort to simplify and enhance um, clarity and understanding with using the menu. Two, we updated the greenhouse gas savings associated. Vehicle fleet will be electric by 2050. Sorry, my mic cut out there. Hope everyone could hear. <laughs> um, and this change, the 2050, is in line with the state's goals, which um, is seeking to have 100% of our transit vehicles be zero emission by 2050. Next slide, please. So this slide shows how the average transit vehicle fleet mix changes over time based on the new assumption with 100% of the fleet being um, zero emission by 2050. And these percentages represent the percent of the fleet that is electrified in the, um, the greenhouse gas planning rules for compliance years. So the first row shows the um, previous version of the PD, what we were assuming, and the second row shows the changes um, that will inform our proposed new changes to the PD. As you can see, the percentage of the fleet that is electric is decreasing under our proposed changes. Um, and so what this really means is that the emission factors that inform our calculations for all the greenhouse gas transit measures have now increased um, because we have changed the percentage of zero emission vehicles in the fleet, which means we have more diesel um, transit vehicles in the fleet. Next slide. So this table shows the five transit greenhouse gas mitigation measures that have been impacted by this change. New fixed route local transit, demand response, and then replacing a diesel bus with either an electric, hybrid, or renewable natural gas vehicle. Um, and as you can see, the greenhouse gas savings for the local routes and new demand response vehicles have decreased because as I said before, we have now increased the assumptions about the number of diesel vehicles that are in the fleet for these measures, which therefore increases greenhouse gases. And then the last three measures, you can see that you now get to take credit for transitioning a diesel vehicle um, in 2040 and 2050, because previously we had assumed that the fleet would already be electrified by then, but now we have changed those assumptions. Next slide. 
So just to reiterate, these changes were made to align some of the variables and assumptions within the calculation methodologies um, with an official state goal that 100% of the transit fleet is gonna be electrified by 2050. Um, this also provides transit agencies and other state enterprises that have been reaching out to our team wanting to calculate the greenhouse gas savings of their work with the most accurate emissions information possible. Next slide. Um, I just, do just wanna note for the commission that within PD 1610, transit is a mitigation measure that we provide the most flexibility for, for calculating the greenhouse gas savings um, for our users. The changes we've made today are just for an average fleet mix. Um, and this is really helpful for when an agency or a user of our menu doesn't really know um, that much information about the transit line that they're trying to calculate the savings for or their, their transit agency's profile. Um, we recommend that users of our menu use the user input transit tool, which um, allows more specificity around calculating greenhouse gas savings. So you can say your own things about occupancy rate, ridership, length, vehicle size, and vehicle technology. So none of this has changed. We are just changing assumptions around the average fleet mix for those agencies that might not have these listed five pieces of information to calculate their savings. Um, and lastly, and, and very importantly, I wanna note, this doesn't affect CDOT's compliance with the planning standard or any of the other MPOs. Next slide, please. Um, I will also note that these changes have gone through the 45 day APCD review and not listed on here. We also brought these proposed changes to our IACT um, who recommended approval and voting this through. And then again, it's worth reiterating that this does not affect CDOT's compliance that we just went through, nor um, Dr. Cobbs or North Grand Ranges. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Eli. So my question is that uh, I have a, a number of friends around the world and every time I have conversations with them about greenhouse gases, they bring up two things. One is they bring up hydrogen and they bring up solid state batteries. So included in your analysis, what have you assumed about either one of those in terms of fleets? So within the fleet for the average fleet mix, we assume it's just a zero emission percentage. So that would include things like hydrogen fleets um, or the solid state mix. My, my question is, we did assume hydrogen would be would be used, and we did assume something about solid state batteries or no. I mean, we, if, if the answer is no, I just I'm just trying to get an understanding because when I have my coffee table conversations with people, that's what they always say. I'm I'm wiser than you because I uh, in India we're doing hydrogen, for example. You know, it's a common thing I get from my friends who live there. And in other parts of the world, I get solid state batteries as a as a big a big initiative. So I'm just trying to figure out in your analysis and your work, how are you incorporating those in there? And if the answer is, and I think Kay has talked about this in the past, about our assessment about hydrogen as a, you know, either it's how long it runs or what have you. I've done a little reading on it, not much, but it seems like it's a reasonable. You know, it's it's reasonable and it actually has some attributes from what I've read about actually being even more positive in terms of its greenhouse gas effects than say using things that use that use battery power, for example. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in because I think related to um, the greenhouse gas rule, um, what we're looking at is tailpipe. So we're not looking at life cycle. So if, if we're talking about a zero emission vehicle, it could be hydrogen, it could be battery, it could be solid state battery, it could be traditional battery. Um, so we're, it doesn't differentiate within the rule. Yeah. Is that, would that be accurate? Yeah, okay. Thank you. We don't need terminal. Any others? Kathleen. Well, first of all, thanks for the update on this. And um, I did have a chance to check in with folks up in, in my area in the North Front Range MPO. They felt supportive of the changes and appreciate you uh, reaching out and working with them. Um, I see the point about it doesn't affect compliance with the rule, but it, it sounds like, or at least it looks like, it would affect compliance by when. So this is 100% 
of the fleet being no emission by 2050 versus 2033. So it's more of a pace about when the emissions would be reduced for the fleet transit fleet. I understand that by 2050, we accomplish it, but it's just instead of accomplishing it by 2033, we'd be accomplishing it by 2050. Is that correct? Right. Okay, so it's a, almost a 20 year. So I, I also want to add on there that it is uh, an average that is that is taken into account, and there are other areas. And it's part if some if an agency uses that particular mitigation measure, we wanted to make sure that the information was correct and that assumptions have been um, um, updated on there. Plus, our recommendation is if you have the information already available to use the uh, user transit tool instead of focusing on the average measure. So that way you get a more accurate representation of what your mitigation level would be on there. So hopefully that helps answer it as well. I'll just add to that the, the targets in table one in the rule were not developed using heavy duty emissions. It's only light duty vehicle fleet mix. So um, it doesn't affect our compliance in that sense either. More so just the emission factors if you really want to get specific on calculating GHG savings. At the end of the day, I'm trying to figure out how are we incentivizing turning the fleet over as soon as possible? Because with a, a useful life of 10, sometimes even 15 years for a transit vehicle, that's a lot of generation of more and more of doing the same. And we're trying, at least for me, and we're, I think it's about accelerating the pace of change in order to address our climate crisis. So uh, not so much in the rule itself, but are there other means by which we're able to incentivize transit operators to switch to other types of fuel vehicles sooner rather than later and not saying, well, I don't have to do it until now 2050. So I'm gonna, it gives me two more cycles to buy the same type of bus. I'm just trying to figure out how are we incentivizing the change? Or not. <laughs> Maybe we're not. Yeah. Barb. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, explain my understanding of this change is to put the transportation planning rule in alignment with the Colorado Energy Office's greenhouse gas pollution mm -hmm. reduction roadmap. So it's not like we're we're pulling back from what we'd like to see. It's more putting it in alignment with the CEO's um, roadmap. Whether we'd like to see that changed, there's an opportunity, by the way, they're doing roadmap 2.0 discussions around the state. So if anybody wants to give input into this 2.0 roadmap, now is the time. Okay, well, thanks for clarifying that, clarifying that for me. Karen. Thanks. When I saw this, um, well, first we had the meeting, but then I saw this come out in, in paper, and I thought it was a good idea to change the, our expectations for transit for a number of reasons. My understanding of this is transit statewide, not CDOT's transit, but all transit. Is that right? Is it all transit? Correct. It's all transit. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought, too. And the last meeting we had, I had just gotten information from RTD that they were delaying their purchases of electric vehicles because of some complications in logistics in that they didn't have a place to store new electric vehicles. They didn't have a facility that they felt comfortable um, combining the, the diesel vehicles and their electric vehicles, and they were not going to meet this target. I, I think that it was unrealistic for them as the largest transit agency in the state of Colorado to be able to meet this time frame. But I does, don't think it means that they're going to postpone doing it. I, I think they have to ramp up. You know, they have to do a transit plan and then they have to go after a grant and then they have to figure out where they're going to store these vehicles. And then they have to change their whole maintenance fleet to figure out how do we maintain these things? We only know diesel. So, uh, uh, you know, that was percolating in my mind when we had our last meeting and I thought, I just don't know how we're going to hit this goal. Or if we have some, an agency like RTD who, who, who have to pull back because they're not ready. 
So um, anyway, that's my understanding, Kathleen, of, 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 of how an agency as large as RTD, who is the biggest transit agency in the state, um, wouldn't just postpone because they don't have to reach the threshold till 2050. They, they're probably still, their leadership is probably still pushing toward getting it done sooner than later, but realistically, we have to have goals that can be met. Yeah, I, I like to see the, the changes because I think it's, they're more realistic, reachable goals from supply chain to, I mean, there's so many factors. It's not just buying, but we have to have the supply of this, the batteries and the, the stuff to be able to actually get them even built. So it's, I don't think we're saying not do it. And I don't think anybody's backing off, but I, I think it's aligning with what we realize is, is achievable in supply chains and ability to get the infrastructure in place to charge them and, and run them. And I mean, all that's been mentioned. So I applaud what's being done. We're, we're making it realistic. So the public has realistic goals that we can reach and not something that we'll never be able to reach. So thank you. Any other, Kathleen? Well, I just want to follow up. I'm not saying I don't support this. I do support the changes that you're making. And I do think it's important to have them have the clarifications and have it be pragmatic and aligned with the other state goals. So I'm not opposed to what you're bringing forward as the change. I just, I guess what it raises the question for me, what else can be done in a parallel process to incentivize the pace of change? Is it the clean transit fleet enterprise? Is it other types of programs? that are being done through the state or through USDOT, but finding ways to, you know, Commissioner Stewart's point, how do we help agencies, large and small, be become ready so that it's not always getting pushed because it's not the, it's not doable or it's not the right time. So that's what I'm asking is what can be done in a parallel process to support this as quickly as possible. Mark. Good point with climate change. Uh looming, uh, it's important question to ask. But I have a question may not be able to be answered today. And that is, what percentage of the transportation segment of emissions comes from transit? Do we know? Because that helps frame that sense of urgency. And my guess is a much larger percentage comes from uh, heavy truck traffic that's moving goods and the personal light duty vehicles we all drive. So I think it would be very interesting, although I won't be here <laughs> uh, at a future meeting to have a breakdown, uh, just to remind us all where to put our priorities to try and bring down the uh, emissions from the transportation section in Colorado and across the nation. I agree. I was thinking the same thing. I think transit is a small portion of where we need to be focusing to get the reduction. So, well, yeah, it's hopefully growing, but, but no, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I think just in response to what are we doing to incentivize, so the Clean Transit Enterprise has $134 million over the next 10 years. Um, we currently have a funding opportunity out for planning funds. Um, and I think that's really critical. What we saw with the Volkswagen settlement funding was that um, a lot of agencies were, were really excited about it, but then they realized, oh, I didn't think about this or that or utility coordination. Or, so there's, there's all these things, right? So we really feel like the gateway into being able to apply for the capital grants for the charging infrastructure and the buses themselves are those smaller planning grants. So we're, we're hoping that a lot of agencies take us up on that. Um, and do the plans necessary to understand, okay, in the next five years, these are the routes that I could electrify. These are the buses that I could get in the next 10 years. This is what it is. Um, and our state goal is actually a thousand transit zero emission vehicles in service by 2030. Um, we're around a hundred right now between vehicles that are in operation and on order. Um, so we're getting there, but um, it, you know, it takes 18 months to order a bus. So um, uh, maybe even longer than that by the time you get everything in place before you can even place the order. So, um, so there are, they are long lead time items. Yeah. If I may, uh, I think I would be remiss to uh, first not acknowledge this has been a great conversation to reflect that this rule is, is responsive to reality. 
So we're we're changing the color of the backdrop to to distinguish what we can't change directly from what we can, so that we can push on the gas pedal on those things we those factors that we can change in the formula. Um, but one of those inputs, of course, reflected by those informational reports we received, and we won't really discuss uh, this round, is that land use planning is one of those that's extremely difficult to put the gas on uh, outside of our control at CDOT, but it, it, it's really critical to success for those um, who submitted plans based on mitigation measures. So, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, up next, Bustang. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you can just stay there for a second. But um, so we do provide quarterly updates on Bustang to the commission in your packet. Um, recently, the bus operations team has given several presentations at a bunch of forums around the state. Some commissioners have attended those. So this is a bit of an encore presentation um, for some folks who've already seen it. Um, but really wanted to take some time to talk about the great successes that Bustang has been having. Um, before I start, I did want to recognize the team. I was hoping some of them would, would be here in person, but in case they're watching online. Um, but I'm just the messenger here. There's a bus operations team that has been doing all of this incredible work. Um, Brian Pokorny is our operations manager. Ben Gelman is our operations specialist. He has responsibility for Bustang. Uh, Jeff Perlwitz is our program manager, um, and his responsibility is with the Outrider program. Uh, and then Jennifer Phillips is the supervisor for that team. Um, but really, all of them are doing great work um, and, and really um, making sure that, that this service continues to grow and, um, and see success. So uh, this is going to provide an uh, overview of what's happened in the last year um, throughout, throughout the whole Bustang family of services. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so when I say Bustang family of services, this is all the stuff that we're talking about. So um, Bustang is our interregional express. This is the OG of Bustang service uh, started in uh, July of 2015. So coming up on our eighth anniversary, these are the large coach style buses. They're operating north, south and west on the interstates. Uh, our outrider service came online in 2018. Um, that has more of a rural focus um, connecting uh, different uh, rural centers throughout the state. Uh, Pegasus launched Memorial Day last year, so um, just celebrated our first an anniversary on that. Uh, those are the van-based, uh, this is our van-based service operating in the Mountain Express lanes on I-70. Um, also gave us some smaller vehicles, which allows us to be nimble with some of our other services and flex those into other places as well, so Pegasus has been great. Uh, we also have seasonal service, uh, Bustang to Broncos during football season, Snowstang during the ski season, um, and Bustang to Estes during the peak uh, tourism season at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so this is the big picture look at Bustang. Uh, so this data is comparing 2022 to 2023, um, really seeing uh, continued growth and ridership. Um, although all of transit had a rough patch in 2020, 2021 um, due to COVID, uh, we've seen 20% growth system-wide in Bustang since 2019. Um, and in particular, the West Line has seen a lot of that growth. Uh, we're carrying 170,000 passengers overall. Um, and then you can see the ridership by route um, reflected on the graph. Um, the DTC route is that one down at the bottom. Um, this used to be um, two runs a day in each direction in a 45-foot bus. Um, we had really low ridership, but with the addition, um, I should say we had low ridership, but we had loyal ridership. Um, so what we were able to do is um, condense that down to one uh, trip in each direction per day and put it in Pegasus van. So um, we're still serving those, those loyal riders. Um, but we're able to do it in a more efficient manner um, with flexing some of the Pegasus vehicles into that route, so which has been successful. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a look at Outrider. Uh, that was 35,000 passengers last year. Um, again, this is operating between those rural regional centers in the state. Uh, we added some new routes this year, um, Sterling to Greeley, Sterling to Denver, and Trinidad to Pueblo. So that brings us to eight total routes um, for Outrider. Uh, next slide. Um, and these next couple slides are going to give um, an update on those 
kind of individual routes. So um, with a few exceptions, that kind of yellow pink line is 2023 and it's above the purple line, which is 2022, which is exactly what we wanna see um, reflecting that the service is growing, which is great. Um, next slide. Um, so this um, on the top, we've got our uh, Crested Butte to Denver and Craig to Denver routes. These are by far our, our most successful. You'll see that the, um, the scale, the, the y-axis scale there is actually in a, a different units than the others. So really um, some great ridership here. Um, conversations about actually adding um, some additional buses on these routes. Um, they've gotten to the point where everyone feels like they can fill more buses. So um, that's really great news. Um, a bit of a contrast on the bottom chart. So our um, you know, new transit routes do tend to have slow starts, but we've had a particularly slow start on the Sterling routes. Uh, based on the feedback that we're receiving um, from the community there, um, we're looking at for some options for those routes to, instead of going into Denver to go directly to the airport. Um, and we've had some conversations, we think um, that will um, improve ridership, but we'll continue to, to take a look at that. We want it to work for the community, obviously. Um, so we're, we're going to be taking a close look at that to understand um, how we can get that ridership up. Uh, we're also about to embark on our inner city and regional bus plan, um, which is going to inform, you know, really how we can address some of these more challenging routes, um, make sure that we're using data to make good informed decisions about, um, about what, how we should move forward, incorporating stakeholder feedback. Um, so based on that, there might be some changes to routes, there might be some changes changes to timetables, might be some changes to stops, um, but we'll, we'll see what the data shows and what the stakeholder feedback shows, um, because we, we really do want to be providing excellent service that um, meets the needs of the community, um, and that study will help us achieve that. Yeah, this Sterling to Greeley route, has there been any discussion with the major employers, um, the packing plants and that food processing about getting employees to start using that. I don't know how much commute between, especially Fort Morgan to Greeley, I think is the big piece on that one that could have ridership, but. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the, there's been a specific conversation with the employers, but I think, you know, that goes into the conversation about timetables, right? If we're running at a time when it works for shift changes, um, it, you know, that might be something that we see, but something right. to keep in mind for sure. It would be, I think, some of the areas to look at in addition to, you know, trying to serve the medical and those other needs. But. Um, and on the next slide, we get into Pegasus. Um, so um, Pegasus just, again, celebrated its first anniversary. I'm really pleased with the service. It's seen steady growth month over month. Um, and the team has been making minor modifications along the way just to improve the service. So in, in less than a year, um, we're starting to consistently see 70% passenger load, which is fantastic um, for a new transit service. So I um, couldn't be more pleased with, with how things are going with Pegasus. Uh, next slide. Um, this gets into our, our seasonal service. So um, Busting to Broncos is a partnership um, with Broncos. It'll start up again in the fall. Um, this data is from last season. Uh, so we were, again, really happy. We had nearly 2,000 passengers. Um, it's $25 for the round trip. You get a designated driver. You get easy access to the stadium. You don't have to deal with parking, hanging out with other fans. Um, so really a win, win, win um, in, terms of, in terms of what the service provides. Um, even if the Broncos didn't win much, we feel like the service is great and a win. Um, we did try a pilot on the West Line. Um, it was not successful. Uh, we canceled most of the routes that we were planning. Um, we did have a group of five people. We put them into a Pegasus van. We're told they had a great time, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure if, um, if we start it up again, um, they'll tell their friends, um, but um, really just didn't see the demand on the West Line. So it was an experiment. We tried it. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye and maybe if the Broncos have a better season, we'll have more interest in folks making that trip for the games. Do you know the the cost of per person of actually the of running this the route compared to what we're charging? I don't have it on hand, but we can find it out and get it to you. Because so. I just these sorts of ones, I think we should have those people pretty much covering those costs if we can mm -hmm. reasonably and yeah. get the ridership. But it's can look at that data for sure. Something that. 
Uh, next up, I think, is Snow Stang. Yep, so, um, so Snow Stang ran, ran this season December 17th through May 7th. Um, we served five resorts this year. Um, it stops at Union Station, Federal Center, and the Woolly Mammoth lots, kind of right on, um, on the hog back there. Uh, so A Basin, Loveland, Steamboat, Copper Mountain um, returned from prior years, and then we also added Breckenridge this year, um, and Breck was a great success. Um, uh, next slide, I think, has, yep, there's the ridership by month. Um, so uh, January and February, obviously the bigger skiing months, so we see, you know, less at the tail ends of the season as um, more of the resorts are, are open or closed. Um, and, you know, really, again, pleased with the service, pleased with our partnerships with the resorts. They were happy, so we'll continue to have this service um, as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was one, actually, um, Commissioner Adams and I were having a conversation. He heard some feedback out in the community about this, but um, this is not part of our snow staying service, but something we're really proud of um, in terms of our efforts to give back to the community. Um, just wanted to highlight this partnership. So this was a special promotion centered around bringing diversity to the mountains, um, aimed at people who've never had the opportunity to participate in snow sports and skiing and snowboarding and such. Um, so CDOT was one of many partners involved in this. We were the transportation sponsor um, and we pro provided the bus service, but there were other folks who provided uh, the winter clothing and um, the rental equipment and the, and the lessons and food and beverage and, and all kinds of things. Um, we sponsored five of the bus trips. They were full to the brim with a waiting list every time. Um, the group was really organized um, and we just feel like this was a great opportunity to, to give back. Um, if there's a future Lindsay Vaughn or someone um, who participated in this program um, who's now been bitten by the ski bug and, you know, wants to get the season pass and go all in, um, they have that experience of yeah. riding busting and um, something that they might continue um, if they decide to do this outside of this special program too. So um, great promotion, um, great to put Bustang's name on this. Uh, Bustang to Estes uh, just launched Memorial Day weekend. This is its fourth season. Um, so this has been a great partnership with the communities, um, added a stop in Broomfield this year, um, it operates on weekends during the peak season for the National Park. Um, we're offering some discounted fares this year to really encourage families and students uh, to go take advantage of the outdoors. Um, you, do, you do need the park pass to get into the National Park, but you don't need the timed entry permit which is really nice. So if you're not, you know, planning ahead um, and on the website in time to get one of those coveted timed entry passes, um, you can get on bus staying, you can get inside the gates and then the transportation system within the park will get you to all the trailheads that you need to go to. So um, it's a really great service. Um, Rocky Mountain National Park also has some construction happening this year at their entrances. So we're hoping that this will help alleviate some of the, the congestion that could be caused by some of those um, construction activities. Um, and then next, just a look at some of the things that are upcoming. Um, I did mention the inner city and regional bus plan earlier. Um, that's going to be starting this summer, completing in 2024. Um, this is going to take a close look at all of our services, um, Busting, Outrider, Pegasus, um, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, we're going to do really robust public outreach on this. Um, and that's going to help influence and provide some direction on future expansions, modifications to the services, just all the things to help us understand where there's demand, where there's unmet need, where we can providing um, better service or more service. So really looking forward to that. Um, the team is in the final steps of our busting expansion study right now. Um, we're going to be finalizing that this month. Um, this was this will feed into that inner city and regional bus plan, but it was more of a quick internal exercise to help us make some more immediate decisions around uh, the Bustang expansion funded by um, SB 22180 from last year. Um, so kind of a, a micro exercise that'll feed into that macro exercise that we're going to be doing um, later this summer with the inner city and regional bus study. Um, we've got some, a bunch of vehicle purchases going. Um, our fleet is aging. Many of our buses were part of that initial purchase for when um, we set up the service in 2015. Our, our fleet drives a lot of miles. Um, so um, we've got some buses on order. Some of those will go into expanding service. Some of them will um, replace buses that, uh, that have reached the end of their life. Um, so that's exciting to have additional fleet that'll give us some more um, flexibility. 
Um, we're also continuing to work on Connected Colorado, which is our, our uh, digital trip planning and ticketing uh, project. Um, it's run into a lot of unexpected contractual hurdles, but we are intending to work with three agencies um, on this software project um, and still looking forward to, to getting it off the ground. Um, our electric bus study is also forthcoming. Um, as I mentioned, we have our first grants for the Clean Transit Enterprise um, already out on the streets uh, for, uh, for folks to apply to. Uh, we also know that Bustang needs to be planning for the zero emission future. Um, so we're gonna be looking at our services and understanding um, where we might be able to put in some electric buses um, and get those, um, get those purchases added to the fleet as well. Uh, the North and the South lines um, are possibilities we think for EVs. The West line might take a little bit longer, but um, in terms of the mileage and the terrain, uh, North and South line, I think will probably be the, the likely early candidates for that, but we'll see what the study says um, when, uh, when it completes. And I think that's all, um, but happy to answer any questions. And again, my, my thanks to the bus operations team, because again, I'm just the messenger here. Mark. Hi, Kate. Hi. Good info. Quick question, being a Clean Transit Inter Enterprise board member, asking a dumb question, can can Bustang qualify for any of our funds on Clean Transit Enterprise? We're a transit agency, so yeah. Right on, okay, okay. thanks. Mm -hmm. We'll look forward to the grant. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen. Great, thank you so much for giving this presentation and it's a fantastic um, overview. Um, I just, I have a few questions, so, um, Again, it's amazing to me to see all the slides and everything that you've accomplished through Bustang and all of the other services just in you know seven years. That's fantastic. So um, I guess the, one of the questions I have has to do with the expansion study and how will that come forward and where will there be opportunity for public input? And the reason I ask about that is I hear a lot from Northern Colorado about are there opportunities for um, like snow staying to go from Fort Collins to Steamboat or for there to be service to Rocky Mountain National Park in Estes from Loveland. So right now, a lot of the bus staying services are obviously centered out of Denver, but are there opportunities to grow those types of routes out of Northern Colorado as well? So that's a, I guess, a two-part question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the inner city and regional bus plan will kick off this summer. We are planning to do a lot of outreach with that. So um, so that's exactly the kinds of things that we want to be hearing, kind of where do, where do we have transit? Where do we not have transit? Where's there unmet need? Where could we be going that we aren't going? So um, so I think a lot of things will be on the table in that particular exercise, and it'll wrap up um, sometime in 2024. So quite a bit of time to get feedback and iterate with with the stakeholders on that. Okay, great. And so will that, I, I know there's been talk about having the transit town halls. And so it, will the transit town halls, I know they're being kind of reformatted or will that tie to that study or are those two separate things? Um, they're two separate things, but um, we're, we're really excited that everyone's so excited about transit and we're, we're trying to get out and talk to as many communities as possible. So um, the transit town halls will be part of that. The busing expansion study will, or sorry, the inner city and regional bus plan will be separate from that, but we'll, I'm sure we'll try to leverage the, the two meetings and not uh, uh, make sure we're using everyone's time wisely. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, on your study, um, like the snow staying, the May dropped way off. Are you going to evaluate kind of what thresholds of ridership determine when you would start and stop those sorts of services? Um, so, so the the ski area start and end dates. Um, it's dependent on the ski area. So, right. so that May number was really low because it was only one weekend and it was only one resort. So, but we had the we had the agreement with the resort for the whole season. So. Okay, so the resort and, the, and they pay some into this, don't they? Yes. Yeah, they, they, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's just a matter of which which resorts are open and closed at which time. Those ta the tails right. of the season depend a lot on the, right. the so opening that, and closing. So dates that's the why that May looks so. That was one weekend, one resort. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so that makes sense. Um, and the other one on the your outreach, public outreach. I think one of the things when you're asking about new routes or areas to serve is to throw in the question: How much are you willing to pay for these routes? You know, so that they're thinking about. Well, yeah, I want it, but then if they have to pay, I think it's a, an element to make sure that 
when you're getting feedback that they're actually thinking about, well, yes, I need to pay a fee also to use that service. So it, I think it would give you a, a more clear answer of how many people might use it if you throw in how much are you willing to pay or, you know, these are the fee schedules, something like that in that. I think it might get a better, better feel for a true ridership over just saying, would you use it or would you support? Because then it's like, well, yeah, I want my neighbor to take it, but not me. I mean, I, that sort of. Kathleen? Well, I don't know. Do others have no. questions? I'll take a turn. <laughs> okay. Um, my other question is um, for the Bustang North route, and, and maybe you and Heather can answer this, but just wondering, like the new mobility hubs are coming online. When will the Bustang buses start using the new mobility hubs in in Northern Colorado? Sorry, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, a tag team no, question. <laughs> right now it's scheduled for spring of 24. Okay. So construction will be completed at the end of this year. And then I think service is intended to kick up like March-ish of 24. Okay, great, thank you. Any others? Okay. Thank you, Kay. Very good presentation. All right, Region 3. Yeah. Well, thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity to come and, and speak today. It's, it's great to come and uh, be able to, to speak in a positive note instead of coming and asking for money or telling you about emergencies or issues. Or <laughs> so it's kind of a change. Uh, I'm Jason Smith. I'm the Region talk, 3 Jason. Transportation Director. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, what Region 3 is, where we're at, you know, we're in Northwest Colorado, we're the largest region in square miles, uh, we have four TPRs, one in EO, 15 counties, um, we work with over 50 local agencies. These local agencies all have transportation needs and issues and we're there to help them try to solve their problems. Uh, we have roughly 580 positions, it says employees, I wish I had 580 employees right now. Um, we, we still you know, have vacancies and we're working on filling, but we are gaining, making progress. Over 5,000 lane miles of highway that we cover, uh, you know, 700 bridges, you know, I don't, around 2,000 or 20,000 culverts, 13 mountain passes, seven tunnels, and, and 13 rest areas. So a lot of infrastructure and facilities for our, our staff. So just wanted to kind of point that out because I, I think it, it helps show the picture a little bit of. of what all CDOT covers. Next slide. So Region 3, you know, we talk a lot about our values. Our, our biggest asset, though, that we have is our employees, um, really are. We have some great people. I'd love to bring them all in here and introduce them to you and let you know what they do, because they do a great job, um, and they, they're really dedicated and outstanding employees. So um, we don't give them enough recognition, and, and so I just want to highlight that today of, of really pointing out that the hard work that they do. Next slide. So just kind of a brief overview of last year, some of the accomplishments we had. Um, so for advertised projects, um, we had about 24 total. Um, that's CDOT advertised projects. You can kind of see on the graph there how that's increased over the years uh, for local agency projects. We have roughly 56 active projects. Um, about $251 million spent in delivering projects, which, you know, every year you're kind of, you're seeing that graph, uh, you know, it, it's increasing. It, that's far more than we had in, in the past years. And we'll have a couple slides here that you'll be able to see that more. So for estimated uh, 2023, we have 26 projects that we're advertising and about uh, $212 million in construction contracts. Next slide. Um, you probably can't read this real well, but uh, just to get the point across for our funding, uh, you can see the spike there and, and kind of how it, it's just been increasing. We project in the next few years, it will kind of drop back down to more of our base program. So, so with that, you see the colors there and at the bottom, um, really in, in blue is our base program. And that's more of our asset management program, uh, the typical funding that we, we get on an annual basis. And then in addition to that, we get the other strategic funding. Um, and then the other bridge enterprise funding. And so all together, you know, you can just kind of see how some of this is, is starting to, to peak out for us. And then if no other funding comes, we'll be back down more in the next few years to our base program for delivery. Um, then for expenditures, kind of tells a little bit of the same story. We, we were on a little bit of a lull coming off of, uh, you know, the about 2016 ramp program. And so we kind of went down to 
to more about that base expenditures. And now we're kind of going back up again. Next slide. Um, just to give you an idea on employees and time, um, the gray here is, is shows our maintenance staff. And you know we're about three quarters maintenance in our um, region. And then the other quarter is more of that engineering and support unit staff. So this is just to give you a kind of an idea of where we stand. Next slide. Uh, region three is made up of three program areas. The West program area um, is really the counties of Mesa County, Delta, Gunnison, Montrose, and Hinsdale. We have two main offices or residency offices in that program, one in Grand Junction, one in Montrose. Um, you know, with this slide, just kind of, it, it lists our projects that you can kind of see here. Some of them are 10 year plan projects. Some of them are completed. Um, some of them are in pre-construction. The blue are, are design pre-construction. The, the orange are the ones that are in construction currently. The ones that have the gray uh, in the name, they're local agency projects. So just to give you an idea of the number of projects we have that we're working on at any one time in our region and area. Next slide. One of the projects I'd like to highlight of the, the West program area is the I-70B first and grand intersection project that we did. Uh, just completed it last year. So if you look at the pictures close, the, the far left, you'll see that that's the old intersection uh, alignment that we had. It was a, a non-standard intersection, kind of a five-legged weird one. If you've ever been to Grand Junction in that area, it's, it was a little confusing to people. A lot of comments back, uh, some accidents in that area. So uh, we started this corridor, or kicked it off. The EA was finished in uh, 20 or 2008. And we've been working on that corridor and construction since uh, 2010. This is the fifth phase that we've completed. Um, and like I said, it was really the, the fix that intersection area. The, the middle picture there is we put it into a roundabout for temporary construction to see how it would flow. Um, so we could move it around and uh, wouldn't have to have temporary signals and that kind of stuff. It was kind of an experimental thing for us, uh, for our construction. We usually use temporary signals for our traffic control, but this actually worked really well. The contractor was able to move that temporary roundabout or, you know, to different quadrants while they were building that intersection. And uh, so it was a very creative idea. Um, then, then the far right picture is the final product that we ended up with. And, and you know, it was a great project. And the, the, we received uh, some um, concrete awards for it because it was concrete paid. Next slide. So our central program, um, as you can see here, same thing, the projects uh, in blue are in, are in design uh, and orange are in construction. Um, and the ones that are in green are complete. Uh, the central program is Garfield, Moffitt, Rio Blanco, uh, Route and Pitkin counties. We have got offices in Glenwood and up in Craig. Uh, next slide. So last week we were able to go up. We had this project on Colorado uh, 13, Fortification Creek Wildlife Mitigation. And it was more than just wildlife mitigation. It was a, a, a corridor improvement project. We've been working on Highway 13 for roughly 20 years now as well. Um, and this kind of finished that link out uh, north of Craig. And we, the highlight of this project though, I mean, we did the normal improvements with uh, safety, shoulders, widening, um, you know, signing, striping, all that. But we really dug into some of the wildlife mitigation up in this area. And that was kind of the highlight of the project that when we did the ribbon cutting last week is that we did some experimental things here, um, this section. And, and what we did, you can see the, the wildlife underpass is, is more of a typical underpass that we did do on uh, our projects uh, with some tall fence. But then north of here, we did what we called was uh, low fence wildlife mitigation. And in the, the, those areas, it was designed so we just had the normal uh, four foot fence, but there's also wildlife detection. So as, as wildlife jumps over the fence, this new technology uh, will monitor the animals and video. And, and as they approach the roadway, the signs will begin to flash. So the signs don't flash continuous at night, but they only flash whenever you know an animal, a, a larger animal is detected getting close to the roadway or on the roadway. So. Uh, kind of neat and experimental, uh, seems to be working right now. We also put in these Zapcrete um, 
crossing pads that are, you, you could think of them as kind of a, an electric fence but they're a pad that when the animals step on them. So these places where we needed to have access to approaches for vehicles and to get across, we put these zap pads so the animals wouldn't walk across. Um, they hit these pads, they get a, a, a small you know, jolt electricity and, and it pushes them back. So uh, neat project. Uh, and it was a great collaborative effort uh, with CPW and they even got some funds that could be identified. So um, next slide. All uh, right, East program, uh, it consists of Lake Eagle, Summit, Grand, and Jackson counties. We have offices in Silverthorne and Eagle. Uh, again, here's our list of projects that they've been working on. Altogether, you can imagine the list of projects that we have right now for the entire region, all three of those together, is quite long, it's significant. Uh, next slide. So one of the projects I wanna highlight here is the East uh, Bell Pass. Auxiliary Lanes project, which it, it's the biggest project we have currently in the region. Um, you see there, it's, it's the number one highest in I-70, I-70 in Colorado with crashes per million vehicles. Um, you know, so that's part of the reason we're doing the project up there is, is to lower those, reduce them, what we think will be about a 40% reduction in crashes where we're completing these improvements. And, you know, we have Bell Pass, you know, over the span of 20, 14 to 2017, it was closed for approximately 306 hours total. That's, that's a lot of downtime. So with these improvements, and, and a lot of that's, you know, inclement weather, trucks spinning out, um, stalling, uh, and you get one truck's, you know, sideways in the road, jackknifed, or you get two of them side by side that spun out. It takes hours then to get in there and you go get it unclogged, basically get those trucks moving again. So um, with this auxiliary lane, It'll help us have more room to, to move, move the traffic around. Um, this project is kind of broken up into five segments. Uh, and as you can see on the left there, we do have, um, you know, the auxiliary lanes as part of our fourth package. And, and right now, you know, getting ready, get it, get ready to put out the bid. Uh, we had CP one and two, um, the, the, and I'll show some pictures here of the truck ramp. So. First package was the truck ramp on Bell Pass. The second one was relocating the uh, recreational trail because it was adjacent to the road and had to be moved to do any work on the roadway itself with alignment. And then CP three and five are the bridges that you've heard about in the past um, through Bridge Enterprise that's funding. Next slide. Uh, some more stuff that we're doing up in the mountain passes, you know, with our freight, uh, focused very heavy on freight up there uh, for these improvements, along with doing the um, truck ramps, uh, you can see kind of through the slides there, the, the far left picture, you see that kind of curved alignment. That is the, the old truck ramp that we had. Um, it wasn't the best alignment, uh, it was created many years ago. A lot of the trucks would come down when they would need to use the ramp. They would end up hitting kind of that curved area and, and rolling over, tipping over, doing a lot of damage to them and injuries to the drivers. Um, and just taking a long time then for us to recover the, the trucks out of the, on off the ramp. So uh, this project was able then to go in and straighten out the ramp, uh, you see in the middle picture there, and a better alignment. And, you know, in the far right picture, you'll see that uh, the truck used it just a few weeks after it was open and then functional. And uh, you can see barrels at the end of the ramp itself. The, the design team thought no truck would ever make it to the end of the ramp. Said, you know, it's designed, it's over designed. Um, those barrels will never get hit. That that first truck that came down was going over 90 miles an hour off of the hill, and he was able to make it all the way to the end of the ramp and he hit our barrels. So it functioned very well. He stayed upright, as you can see there. It didn't roll the truck or anything, so it functioned like it was designed. Um, we also are doing quite a few other improvements for freight um, up on Straight Creek that's west of the. Uh, Eisenhower Tunnel. And coming down the hill, we've been, you know, we, we have again runaway trucks um, that are speeding, issues up there. So, doing a lot of signing, uh, notification in that area, and trying to figure out what we can do. We're also doing truck parking expansion um, along with the truck ramp uh, creation and then the third lane on Bell Pass. Next slide. So, that's kind of the engineering, you know, the you, you hear a lot about our projects and see lists and, and we talk about them. Other things that we do in the regions, um, 
you know, I, I want to give a shout out to some of our specialty support units. They, they, you probably don't even know a lot of what they do or understand, you know, how we get things done in, in the background, but we do have region materials units and labs. Um, we have one in Grand Junction. Uh, it's a great lab facility. We're able to test, you know, HMA or, or hot mix of asphalt, concrete, and soils. Uh, we tested seven projects for Boyd's acceptance. We have different quality levels um, for our, our HMA projects, our overlays, and voids is one of the more stringent kind of testing procedures. And, and so we, we try to do as many of those as we can. It takes extra staff and time. Um, so we're not able to do all of our jobs with Boyd's acceptance, but some of them. So um, we're able to do that in our labs here in the region. We also have a mobile lab that we move around that does that same kind of verification and Boyd's acceptance testing. Um, and it kind of has the same capabilities. And then anything that we can't handle in the region, we do bring over to the headquarters lab, you know, testing. Next slide. Um, also the materials unit, we have a, a, what they call an IA, independent assurance testing group. And they go out then and check our contractor versus our CDOT testers. So this is an in-house end of third party independent kind of group that checks everybody. They also do our, our pavement design drilling and that, that we have a finals coordinator that reviews all of the, the documentation at the end of a job. So this is part of our materials unit. Next slide. So right away, you hear every month about some of our right away acquisitions, uh, appraisals. So you kind of understand those sides of the right away group. We also have our um, survey group within our right away units that, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight here and point out some of the things that they're doing. So in region three, we have purchased an unmanned aerial system, uh, UAS or drone. Um, and with that, it comes, you know, we put a LIDAR system, which is a surveying system. And then we take it up, um, you know, in the air and, and we're able then to, to get a survey in a matter of, you know, minutes basically. Um, of these areas. Uh, in the bottom right hand side, you can see that picture. It's hard to make out, but that is our washout on State Highway 133 at the culvert. We were able to get out there really quick after that washout um, happened. And our team got the drone up in the air, got the survey done. Um, you know, and they have to be uh, licensed pilots to put, you know, to fly these drones. And there's a lot of rules and restrictions. So it, it's not just a small little drone like you see. This thing's good size, um, and and you know so it's it's risky, and they have you know, control what they're doing. So they follow all the rules um, set by uh, FHWA. Um, with this, uh, it, yeah, quite a few things they can do with it. They can also do photos and different things. But uh, the team does a great job, you know, getting out there. I just wanted to point out that that's the. Uh, one of the new things we're using for technology and really pushing our staff to kind of keep up um, with the outside sector. It is. So yeah, it is our washout across the road. That was one of the things we were nervous about is the railroad is, is upstream. Um, it, it's elevated as you can see on a structure. And then in between the road and the railroad is an irrigation ditch. So that kind of black thick line through there is irrigation. So. And then there's other utilities and things. So it's, it's a very complicated little area. And that, that's what made it hard for us to put our detour in. Um, you know, couldn't really just route traffic right around it because there was other obstacles in the way. Uh, next slide. Uh, one to go. So I do want to shout out to the, our maintenance guys. You know. We have great maintenance crews. We have two maintenance sections, one kind of in the south portion of the region and one to the north, uh, maintenance section two. John Lormay does a great job at, you know, all the time of highlighting all the great things they do. You know, they have the winter operations and you hear a lot of, of their accomplishments. Um, then in summer, everybody thinks they're out just, uh, you know, fixing potholes and, and fence. They, they do quite a bit more than that, really. Um, this year, as you're hearing, uh, with the high water and the flooding. Uh, we weren't able to jump out there and do as much as we'd like on pothole repairs because a lot of our staff was having to kind of respond to some of the emergencies and these do what we call bridge watch. And so a lot of them that get close that we're worried about with scour critical or, or debris coming down, 
they actually have to get out there and, and watch those almost on a continuous basis to, to make sure that the debris is going underneath or pull the logs and, and larger stuff out, you know, of the river so it, it doesn't clog up and then, um, you know, could potentially wipe out the bridge structure. Uh, next slide. Same thing with our maintenance section six up to the north, uh, you know, doing a lot of bridge watch. They also, though, in addition to that in the spring, doing quite a bit of rock slide uh, and debris flow cleanups. And then the potholes, as you know, and you kind of speak of is, is right up there at the top as well. Uh, next slide. One thing our maintenance special crews did this year, uh, kind of identified a timber structure bridge. Uh, down by uh, Austin, which is a Hotchkiss area in you know, Delta County. And, you know, we, we work with our staff bridge group. And, and so we have these timber bridge structures still out in the regions that are fairly old, most of them. But um, the, the timber bridges are, are starting to get weak and fell. So they came up with this design to do these sister beams. Um, and, and in this case, there was 19 of these beams that were about 24 inches, you know, or 24 foot long, 12 inches by six inches galvanized. And you put these sister beams in place and our maintenance crews, instead of getting a contractor, they got out there, they got the equipment needed and they took these on as, as extra projects. So kind of shows, you know, that they can do more than just the typical kind of maintenance activities. Uh, next slide. Uh, so our traffic group and, and safety, so they also, do a lot more than just the signing and striping and replacement and safety, you know, projects or items. Um, we also have utility program uh, here, the utilities office that we have did over a thousand utility and special use permits. So anytime we have somebody wanting to do anything in our right of way, basically they have to have a special use permit. We have to review it and make sure that they're not doing anything that negatively impacts our roadway. So. Um, so that group's very busy trying to look at all those requests and get them processed. Uh, they support then out in the field and construction, and there's about 87 different projects they're trying to, to support in the utilities program. Uh, we have an access group, so if anybody's ever worked, um, you know, with a local agency, that there are a lot of times wanting to add access permits uh, and sometimes even uh, residential access permits. We have a group, they issued about 158 of those permits last year. Next slide. That's really all I have. Um, you know, open it up for questions. We're changing department. Um, you know, it's funny, RTDs all talk and each of the regions are a little different and unique, but um, really we're seeing the huge change, you know, with technology. Um, some of these things that, you know, they're kind of taking us in, into the century. And, and, you know, it's, it's neat to see. It really is. ITS devices, we're getting so many of them out on our roads. We're having to change and keep up with the times. Uh, different infrastructure we're trying to maintain. These wildlife, you know, uh, overpasses, underpasses, the fence, these different devices we're using, we, they all have to be maintained. So we're trying to figure out and how we adjust, you know, with, with the changing organization. With that, any questions? Yeah, just one on those zap pads. <laughs> um, the longevity of those and the cost effectiveness compared to just cattle guards. How was that evaluated or who's paying? Yeah, that's a good question. How long? I think they had a 20 year life on them, <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. We're not really sure how long they're going to last, you know, with the inclement weather up there. I mean, it's an harsh environment up north. Of and, yeah. And you're dealing so, with vehicles running across. And, and that's part of it too, is I, you know, trying to know, you know, Snow gets deep up there. How are these things going to, how much effectiveness are they going to really have at that point? Are they going to be able to, you know, to, to get covered up and uh, animals will walk across? We still do have the cattle guards or the deer guards that we call them, um, but these will just help to tear the you know, deer and elk away from the guards. Sometimes they still try to cross the cattle guards that we have. Jump, yeah. um, so this is just one of those things we're trying to push them back. I was just wondering, longevity of those 20 years sounds really long for an electronic device. For an electrical device. <laughs> yeah. Especially with traffic across it and yeah, weather conditions. Barb. Yeah, I just want to thank Jason for, for a great readout of what's happening in Region 3. It's an enormous region and a lot of competing uh, projects for, for funding. And 
handling all the political issues with uh, planning uh, across all those TPRs is, is not insignificant. So good for you for managing all of that. I just wanted to um, point out the great intent and execution on wildlife crossings, trying to mitigate these linear barriers to wildlife movement and migration. Uh, the study that was done cooperatively between CPW and CDOT uh, was the seed for a lot of the work we see now implemented in your project. So um, it, it's been a great partnership and I'm very pleased to see them uh, be realized. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, again. Thank you so much for the overview. Um, it was, uh, I was fascinated by the numbers and just seeing the magnitude. Um, I have a quick question regarding uh, the Colorado 92 timber structure bridge. That was impressive. I mean, those pictures look amazing. And it looked like it was a lot of work and a very specialized work. Are there more structures like that in Region 3 that we are probably going to have to keep in mind? Yes, there are. Um, I can tell you exactly how many, but, you know, we used to have a lot of them. We replaced quite a few of them at this point, uh, but we, we still probably have up over 20 I would say that these timber structures on our state highway system that, you know, they're still good structures and they're stable, but that reinforcement, you know, just for the loading uh, is good. So this was a pilot project and we, we plan on doing more, it, but it does, you know, it takes that extra funding. So we're always working with our staff bridge group to try to figure out how to fund these types of projects. But now that we have the knowledge and, and ability to do it and, and the team kind of has the confidence, I think the next ones will go much easier. And, oh, sorry, a follow-up question. And is your sense that we have like 10 years before we have to go through all of them or is there a longer life? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. They get inspected on an annual basis. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how, how that, um, you know, prolongs the life of that structure. Jason, do you mind if I jump in? So that the Timber Bridge, it's a, it's a statewide program. So um, a lot of focus in region four, region one. Well, region one has a couple. I think it's mainly mainly for um, our staff bridge developed uh, some specifications and standard sheets for these uh, sister bridge or sister team um, fixes. So it's really dependent upon the availability of maintenance staff to get out there and do it. Um, we could make it a capital program and go out there and do it, but we focus a lot on the <clears throat> load restricted bridges so that we can open up uh, more of the permitting loads across the state. But it seems to be a, a pretty um, efficient fix uh, to increase the long, longevity of the bridges. Yeah, I think that's a good program, but we need to get those bridges replaced because the pilings and stuff are routing out as dealt with those as a county commissioner and things. We usually just put in big culverts, but um, <laughs> you have scour issues and things with those um, whenever they do run. But um, I appreciate the work that's being done to extend the life of those until we can get them replaced. In you know, Region 4, we every year we have that bridge timber replacement program where they're going through and they bundle them into design projects so that they can just get several done in one year with one design that fits the different areas. So it's do we have a number statewide how many of these old timber bridges we do still have at all? Uh, yeah, we have all that information. I can get staff bridge to pull that and get it to you. I was kind of wondering how many of those are still out there um, that will need to be replaced because that would just get old. Yeah. So it, we yeah. can extend the life some, but it is limited. <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate that. They're well built, though. I'll give them credit. You know, they were built to last. Yeah, and I just I just want to know we we do this on on uh, bridges that. Uh, the uh, substructure is sufficient. We're not going to go out and uh, re make repairs to some of the superstructure and stuff when, when we have scour issues and pier issues and stuff like that. It's tech technically where the these girders are causing the the poor rating of the of the bridges. So we'll go in there and do those. But the ones that we know that even if we didn't put a sister beam, that the foundation is no good. We would we would we try to just. Uh, stay away from those and focus on the ones that it provides the most benefit to. Yeah. I appreciate that work because it, it's good to extend the life. So. 
Thank you so much. It seemed like there was something else I was going to end the presentation. I'll ask you later if I think of it. So I have to look okay. through it. Yeah, I'll be happy. Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Oh, I wanted to correct. I had said 4,000 in Region 4 for bridges. I was corrected. We have a 902 in Region 4. The 4,000 is about statewide bridges. So just wanted to clarify that. So thank you. <laughs> CPR boundary update. Yep. Jamie, I don't know if you want to join me. Okay. Uh, this will be a pretty quick update. Uh, some of these slides are just review, but just wanted to give you an update of the progress we've made so far. So Jennifer, you can go to the next slide. Uh, happy to talk about the statutory requirements. We've already, uh, we did that last month. Just wanted to make sure we included that in the packet. So you have it if you need a refresher. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, the statutory requirements, this is related to the things that we would be looking at from a from a boundary mapping standpoint. The next slide. Uh, status update, we're continuing to meet with all the TPRs. We've met with a couple of the MPOs at their request as well. Uh, mapping tool is getting close. We had a good meeting with uh, Dar uh, Darius's team uh, this morning uh, on the map and, and then translating some of those static maps to the tool where we can do layers and zoom ins and things. That's going very well. Um, as part of the transparency requirements uh, and consistency in the planning process, we've been looking at TPR IGAs and bylaws. Um, at first glance, you think, oh gosh, there's a lot of these, these TPRs that don't have any bylaws. But in some cases, they're IGAs from 1993, and may, which may or may not have been updated since then, have a lot of the things that you would include in the bylaws, like how do we select our chair, what's the voting process, things like that are in their IGAs. So from one standpoint, it's good. A lot of that necessary information that maybe we thought wasn't there is there, but some of that stuff, wouldn't you want in bylaws? Because that's easier to change than than in the IGAs where you have to go back to every member of government and get a signature because the IGA is, IGA is really the formation document, not the how we conduct business generally. So we're still assessing that and we'll probably have some recommendations along those lines. Uh, we formed an advisory committee and I'll talk about that in the next, uh, next slide. And then we're also uh, looking at, I think we are gonna do a survey um, of folks to try to get some input on, on um, uh, what they think about the boundaries, what they think about TPRs, the planning processes, and things like that. It, uh, this, the statute requires that we that we receive public comment. We want to do that through public meetings. We want to do that through surveys. We want to do that through advisory committee. We want to do that through going to all of the TPRs, having all those conversations. A survey will be just one more way we can receive some input. Uh, next slide. This is the advisory committee. I'm not going to go through all the names, but you can see uh, who we've selected. We had our first meeting with them uh, about a about last week. Uh, last week uh, it was a good meeting. Um, we anticipate a couple of the, the things that we want to run through them um, because as CDOT staff, we're only CDOT staff. We're not elected officials. We're not staff of MPOs. We're not staff of, of TPRs. So getting some input from some of those folks we think is is helpful and rounds out uh, rounds out our process a bit, particularly when it comes to things like the public meetings and the questions for the survey. We want to we want to have a, a team of folks that can look at that stuff and give give us some advice on, you know, what should the public meeting look like or what's what what might be some good questions for the survey. So that's really the the there'll be a, a tool to help us uh, help us identify some of those important factors when we work on this study. Uh, next slide. And that's it. So happy to answer any questions. It's it's going along pretty well. I think we'll probably do public meetings end of July, beginning of August. Uh, still looking at what that format looks like. Um, we're getting close to the tool in a couple of weeks. I think we'll be able to share that out with you all too, so you can see what that mapping tool is. So it's really interesting, really, really good information, and we think could even be useful when we kick off the statewide plan. Uh, next year, because uh, there's lots of lots of good data associated with that. So that's where we're at. Karen. Thank you. Will the advisory committee be the agency that will recommend possible changes to the TC? Or no. will it be CDOT staff? It'll be CDOT staff. 
Thanks. Kathleen. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to, to Herman for making the rounds <laughs> in Northern Colorado. You had a double header a couple of weeks ago with both the upper front range uh, TPR and the North front range. So thank you for doing all of that outreach in person and um, getting the input uh, from folks. I think that's really important. Um, I had a check in with some folks earlier this week and one of the questions that came up was on my understanding is this will look at the stack representation, but also it mentions track and there's not a lot of understanding or familiarity among uh, community members about what track is and the purpose and how it's either functioned in the past or maybe how it's envisioned to function in the future. So maybe as part of your outreach, that would be an opportunity to clarify information about that. Yeah, good idea. Yep. Thank you. Any others? Okay, all righty. Consent agenda review. Didn't know if anybody had any questions of the consent agenda items, which was, um, of course, minutes, IGA approval of over 750,000 and the maintenance projects of 150 to 250. Uh, disposal of property and audit division policy update. Couldn't see too much in those if there were just in questions or things on that. So, if not, I guess uh, right away, fee based right away was postponed. So, I guess we're adjourned. So, and is there a reception for Nick? or yes uh races right races uh at i think it was scheduled for 4 30 but i think it's upon the adjournment <laughs> yep thank you see you all tomorrow